थ्री स्वामी शिवानंदा सम पीपल थिंक मैरिज इज अ फॉर्म ऑफ बॉन्डेज एंड वंस मैरिड देयर इज लिटिल चांस ऑफ मेकिंग एनी प्रोग्रेस इन स्पिरिचुअल लाइफ बट इन द हिंदू ट्रेडिशन मैरिज इज रिगार्डेड एज सेक्रेट मोस्ट ऑफ द गॉड्स आर मैरिड एंड सो आर द अवटार्स और डिवाइन इनकारनेशन इफ मैरिड लाइफ वर अनहोलसम एंड अनहोली द एंशियंट सेजेस वुड हैव सेट दिस ऑन द कॉन्ट्रेरी दीज सेंटली लॉगिवर्स सेंटिफाइड ऑल फोर स्टेजेस ऑफ लाइफ एंड कॉल्ड दैम आश्रमास ब्रह्मचार्य आश्रमा और स्टूडेंट लाइफ गर्हस्था आश्रमा और हाउस होल्डर्स लाइफ वनप्रस्था आश्रमा और फॉरेस्ट ट्वेलर्स लाइफ एंड सन्यासा आश्रमा और मोनेस्टिक लाइफ दे गेव प्लेंटी ऑफ फ्रीडम फॉर इंडिविजुअल्स टू स्विच फ्रॉम वन स्टेज टू अनदर फॉर एग्जाम्पल If a student feels intense renunciation he or she may embrace the monastic life without going through the intermediary stages Shri Ramakrishna married in order to demonstrate how to transcend ordinary marriage He had no physical relationship with his wife as he saw the divine mother in all women Four of his monastic disciples were married and Swami Shivananda was among them Tarak Shivananda's premonastic name had to marry against his wishes. His father did not have enough money to pay the dowry for his youngest daughter Niroda's marriage, so he arranged for an exchange marriage. This meant that Tarak would have to marry his brother-in-law's sister, so that neither party would have to pay any dowry. Tarak's wife, Nityakli, was a highly evolved soul. Unfortunately she died within a year of the marriage as as it is said birth marriage and death are not in the hands of human beings though he was married shivananda maintained unbroken chastity and became known as mahapurush great soul in the ramakrishna order it is said that the master touched a part of tarak's body and said dive deep in the ocean of satchidananda and this extinguished his lust forever one shivananda later related in those days when we used to visit the master i frequently had to go home because i was married it was distasteful to me somehow or other i would spend the night at home repeating the name of the lord i spoke about it to the master and prayed that my worldly bondage be destroyed After hearing my story the master asked me to perform a certain ritual and said in a tone of assurance have no fear i am here to protect you think of me and perform this ritual nothing adverse will happen to you i am telling you that even if you sleep in the same room with your wife you will be free from danger you will see it will rather intensify your spirit of renunciation The master prescribed the same ritual for Swami Brahmananda. I went through the ritual as instructed and didn't have any trouble. In the course of conversation I once mentioned this incident to Swami ji Vivekananda he was very much surprised and remarked what do you say it is the characteristic of a mahapurush you are certainly one since then he started calling me by this name and others did the same dot to tharaknath ghosal was born on thursday 16th november 1854 at barsat a small town east of calcutta his father ramkanai ghosal was a devout brahman and a worshipper of the divine mother in his house he established a panchamundi a tantric place of worship in which five skulls are placed under the ground where he would practice tantric sadhana His wife Vamsundari was a loving spiritual woman. Ramkanai, a successful lawyer, was very generous to the poor and to holy people. He was the secretary of the local school and provided room and board to nearly 30 poor students in his house. His and Vamsundari's first child was a daughter named Chandi. The holy couple prayed to Lord Tarkeshwar Shiva for a son. and performed austerities for a year one night vamsundari had a dream in which lord shiva appeared before her and said i am pleased with your devotion 
I bless you. You will be the mother of a spiritual son, three because the child was born by the grace of Tarkeshwar Shiva, his parents named him Tharaknit. An astrologer made a horoscope, which indicated that the child either would be a monk or a king. Later, when Tarak became a monk, he threw the horoscope into the Ganges and thus renounced the memory of his past life. Tarak had two other younger sisters, Shiroda and Niroda. Vamsundari died within three months of Niroda's birth. Tarak was then nine years old and his young heart cried for his loving mother. However, his father married again. About the same time, his elder sister Chandi died, leaving two children. In addition, his second sister Kshiroda became a widow. These family misfortunes placed the seeds of renunciation in Tarak's young mind. He began his education at the Barsak Missionary School and later went to high school. He was a good student but did not care much for academic education. He was serious and deeply indrawn by nature and he found delight in prayer and meditation. His headmaster remarked about him, Tarak's character had such depth and purity that we were all charmed and impressed by it, for when he was in the 10th grade, Tarak learned that his father's income had been reduced. In order to help the family financially, he left school and looked for a job. He worked for some years for the railways, first in Ghaziabad and then in Mughalsarai, in northern India. He later expressed the feelings he had during that time, since my boyhood I didn't care for family life and I had a spiritual inclination in my heart. I shall never be bound to this world by getting married, this idea was deep in my mind. I had an innate desire to travel to various holy places. I used to work for the railways and call on God. Five while he was working in Mughalsarai, Tarak spent long hours practicing meditation. He later recalled, then the idea of Samadhi would agitate my mind. How to be absorbed in the bliss of Samadhi forgetting the world, this keen desire occupied me most of the time. I was very fond of the meditation pose of Shiva and Buddha. I tried to attain Samadhi month after month, I rarely slept at night. I had that one thought how to attain Samadhi, six one day while they were talking about Samadhi, his roommate Prasanna mentioned the name of a person who had experienced genuine Samadhi, Sri Ramakrishna of Dakshineswar. At this time, as mentioned earlier, Tarak had to marry against his wishes. He took full responsibility for his young wife, Nityakli, and explained to her his hunger for God. Tarak also gave her spiritual advice and guided her in leading a spiritual life. At the request of his friends, Tarak moved to Calcutta, where he was offered a position with the mercantile firm of Machinin, McKinsey and Company. He stayed at a relative's house in Calcutta and during the weekends would visit his wife at Barsat. At that time, the Brahmo Samaj movement under the leadership of Keshab Chandra Sen was very popular in Calcutta. Keshab's soul-stirring sermons and rational approach to religion appealed to Tarak and he became a member of the Brahmo Samaj. But this movement did not quench his insatiable hunger for God at night, he would cry and pray to God for Samadhi. First Meetings with Sri Ramakrishna One Saturday in May or June of 1880 Tarak met Sri Ramakrishna at the Calcutta home of Ramchandra Datta. One of Ram's relatives, who was a devotee of the Master, worked with Tarak in the same office. He had shared with Tarak all he knew about the Master and had told him that the Master would be at Ram's that night. Tarak had also read much about Ramakrishna in Keshab's paper, Dharmatattva, so he wanted very much to see him. When Tarak arrived at Ram's house, he found Sri Ramakrishna in ecstasy. Oblivious of his surroundings, the master asked, Where am I? Someone answered, At Ram's house. 
विच राम डॉक्टर राम ओ यस देन ही रिमेन्ड साइलेंट फॉर अ वाइल तारक लेटर रिकॉर्ड दिस फर्स्ट मीटिंग दैट इवनिंग आई वेंट टू राम बाबूज हाउस आई फाउंड द मास्टर सिटिंग इन अ रूम क्राउडेड विथ पीपल द मास्टर वॉज इन एन एक्सटैटिक मूड I saluted him and sat nearby. One can well imagine my surprise when I heard him talking eloquently on a subject which I had been so eager to know about samadhi. I remember that he elaborated on nirvikalpa samadhi. He said that very few can attain it and that if one attained it one's body dropped off in 21 days. Seven Tarak did not get a chance to talk to the master on this occasion. but a month later he went to see him one saturday evening after work he and a friend took a boat to dakshineswar in the dim light of an oil lamp he saw the master seated cross legged in his room with three or four others on the floor in front of him ramakrishna asked affectionately have you seen me before tarak answered that he had recently seen him at ram's house Tarak bowed down to the master putting his head on the master's lap and the latter gently caressed his head Tarak reminisced at once i felt a deep attachment for the master i felt as if i had known him a long time my heart became filled with joy i saw in him my tender loving mother waiting for me so with the confidence faith and certitude of a child I surrendered myself to him placing myself entirely under his care I was certain that at last I had found him for whom I had been searching all these days From then on I looked upon the master as my mother ate the vesper service in the different temples began and the sound of bells drums and cymbals reverberated in the temple garden Rama Krishna was in a divine mood Shortly he asked Tarak do you believe in god with form or without form in god without form replied Tarak you can't but admit the divine shakti who manifests herself in many forms also said the master he then accompanied Tarak to the kali temple where the evening service was taking place the master prostrated before the image of the mother Tarak at first hesitated to follow his example as he was a member of the Brahmo Samaj which did not approve of image worship but suddenly the thought flashed across his mind why should i have such prejudices even if this image is only an image god must still be present in it since he is everywhere nine tarak then prostrated before the image of the mother after returning from the temple The master asked Tarak to stay overnight with him but Tarak declined because he had already promised to stay with his friend who lived in Dakshineswar The master was pleased and remarked one should keep one's word Speaking the truth is the austerity in this Kali Yuga After a pause the master said all right come tomorrow when Tarak returned the next afternoon the master received him cordially He talked to him about spiritual life, served prasad that had come from the temple as supper, and arranged his bed in the southern veranda, which was adjacent to his room. That night there were no other visitors. Tarak recalled, "Out of joy, I did not sleep that night. At midnight, I saw that the master was in ecstasy and pacing naked in his room." He was also muttering something. Shortly he came to the veranda and asked me, "Hello, are you sleeping?" "No, sir," I replied. "Could you chant a little of Lord Rama's name?" After I chanted Rama's name for some time, he calmed down. Thus I passed that night with joyful intoxication. In the morning while I was taking leave bowing down to the master, he said, come again alone then during my second or third visit i was serving him when he suddenly touched my chest while in an ecstatic mood that touch made me lose outer consciousness and sent me into a deep meditative state i do not know how long i remained in that state 
As a result, everything became revealed to me. I realized that I was the Atman, eternal and free. I realized that the Master was the Lord born as man for the good of humanity and that I was on earth to serve Him. He gave me a similar blessing another day under the banyan tree in the Panchavati.11 Ramakrishna recognized Tarak as one of his inner circle. Later Tarak reminisced. One day Sri Ramakrishna said, Well, so many people come here. I seldom ask anyone about his home and family or desire to know anything about these things. But when I first met you I felt that you belonged here that I would like to know the particulars of your home, parents and the like. Can you tell me why? Where is your home and what is your father's name? In reply, I told him I came from Barsat and my father's name was Ramkanai Ghosal. Hearing this, the master said, Indeed, you are Ramkanai Ghosal's son. Now I understand why the mother aroused this desire in me for information about your home. I know your father very well. He is the attorney for Rani Rasmani's estate. The Rani and her family always thought highly of your father and whenever he would visit the garden at Dakshineswar, they would do everything to make him comfortable, carefully arranging his accommodation, meals, servants and the like. He is certainly a highly developed sadhka, spiritual aspirant. In the early days, 1850s, whenever he came here, he would take his bath in the Ganges, put on a red silk garment and enter the mother's temple. He looked like a veritable Bhairava, celestial attendant of Shiva. He was tall, stout and fair complexioned and his chest was always red. He meditated for long periods in the mother's temple. And he used to bring with him a musician who would sit behind him singing songs symbolically describing the nerve centers in the human body as well as songs about Mother Kali. Your father would be absorbed in meditation with tears streaming down his cheeks. When he left the temple after meditation his face would be flushed with spiritual emotion and nobody would dare approach him. At that time, I was suffering from an unbearable burning sensation all over my body. When I met your father, I said, Well, you are a devotee of the mother and so am 1.1 also practice meditation, but can you tell me why I feel a burning sensation all over my body? Look, the burning sensation is so intense that the hairs of my body have been cinched. It is sometimes excruciating. Your father recommended that I wear an amulet bearing the name of my chosen deity. Strange as it may seem, with the wearing of this amulet, the burning sensation at once diminished. Would you ask your father to visit me sometime? In those days I was living in Calcutta, going home only occasionally. My father was very pleased when I told him about Sri Ramakrishna and he came one day to see the master. On another occasion the master said, Your father's spiritual practices were attended with some desire for worldly objects. As a result of his spiritual practices, he amassed much wealth and also spent it nobly. Twelve on one occasion Tarak requested the master to give him the experience of Samadhi. The master told him, you will get it. Don't be impatient. The Divine Mother will bless you at the right time. Another day the master took Tarak to the Panchavati and wrote a mantram on his tongue which put him into deep meditation and he lost consciousness of his body. Later the master brought him back to normal consciousness by rubbing his chest with his fingers. This is a kind of tantric initiation in which a guru imparts spiritual power to his disciple. Swami Sardananda wrote in Sri Ramakrishna, the great master that the master's touch roused an upsurge of longing for God in Tarak's mind, suddenly all the knots of his heart were loosened. Tarak recalled his wonderful experiences during his early encounters with the master. When I first started visiting the master, 
I often felt inclined to cry. One night I was crying uncontrollably by the riverside near the Bakul tree. The master was in his room and he inquired where I had gone. When I returned he asked me to sit down and said, The Lord is greatly pleased if one cries to Him. Tears of love wash away the mental impurities accumulated through the ages. It is very good to cry to God. Another day when I was meditating in the Panchavati grove, my concentration became very deep. The Master came towards me from the pine grove, and as soon as He looked at me, I burst into tears. The Master stood still. I felt something creeping up inside my chest and I was overcome by a fit of shaking. The Master said that my crying was not insignificant. It was a type of ecstasy. I then followed him to his room where he gave me something to eat. The awakening of the Kundalini, the spiritual energy, was an easy matter for him. He could do this even without a touch, but by a mere look. G days with Sri Ramakrishna S. N. Ramakrishna did not teach his disciples through books or sermons, but through the example of his own life. At every moment, with every movement, he demonstrated how to practice religion. Tarak was fortunate to live with and serve the Master at Dakshineswar and Kosipore. Like me, other disciples, Tarak recalled his experiences and his observations of the Master. These reminiscences are important testimonies about the life of an avatar. That is why it is better to reproduce them rather than to paraphrase. Tarak recalled, His hands were very tender. But why speak just of his hands? His entire body was so. For instance, a type of luchi, fried bread, with a hard crust once cut his finger. At night the master would eat perhaps one or at the most two small luches with a little porridge. Because he could not digest whole milk, Holy Mother would add water and cook it with farina, making a pudding. He would take a little of that. In the cupboard there would be sweets made of fresh cheese. Whenever he was hungry he would eat one or two pieces or perhaps half of one piece giving the rest to others who were there. His ways were like those of a child. It was as if he himself were a child. Once the Master said, In the future many white-complexioned devotees will come here. God is all-merciful. He is not limited by time, place or person. Blessed we are. We had the opportunity to serve the Master, making bitter rolls and preparing tobacco for him. How fortunate we are! We served the Master and we received so much love and affection from him. His compassion and love for us were infinite. In those days we used to sleep on the floor of his room. At bedtime the Master would tell us how to lie down. He would say that if we were to lie flat on our backs, and visualize the mother in our hearts while falling asleep, then we would have spiritual dreams. He asked us to think of spiritual things while going to sleep. During the summer we used to sleep on the veranda and were bothered by mosquitoes. The master looked upon Swami Brahmananda as Gopala, the boy Krishna, occasionally he would send him to visit his relatives at home, but when Swami Brahmananda was not with him, the Master had great difficulty taking care of himself. One night at 1 a.m. the Master came out to the veranda where I was sleeping and asked, Could you chant the name of Gopala for me? I chanted for an hour. Some nights when he did not have anybody around him, he would call the night guard to chant the name of Rama for him. What love the Master had for the name of God! We saw how little the Master slept. Now and then he might get an hour or half an hour of sleep at the most. Most of the time he was absorbed in Samadhi and the remaining time he spent in spiritual moods. These moods became very pronounced at night. He would spend the whole night repeating the name of Mother or Hari. 
When we stayed with the master at Dakshineswar, we were filled with awe. He had no sleep at all. Whenever we awoke, we would hear him talking with the Divine Mother in a state of spiritual inebriation. He would pace back and forth in the room, all the while muttering something inaudibly. Sometimes he would wake us in the middle of the night and say, Hello, my dear boys. Have you come here to sleep? If you spend the whole night in sleep, when will you call on God? As soon as we heard his voice, we would quickly sit up and start to meditate. While coming down from Nirvikalpa Samadhi and still under its influence, Sri Ramakrishna would try to describe that state, but he was never successful. Eventually he would say, I wish very much to tell Va about it, but I cannot. Somebody shuts my mouth. Really, that state cannot be described. Only he who has had the experience can understand it. The Master would not readily allow me to render personal service to him. This often pained me very much. Then, from an incident that happened one day, I learned why he was so unwilling. Who, indeed, can understand his motives? On that day I stayed at Dakshineswar. Other devotees were there also. After spending a long time in his room talking about religious matters, he got up and proceeded towards the pine grove to answer the call of nature. Usually one of the devotees would follow him on such occasion with his water pot to pour water on his hands as he could not touch anything metal. When he went to the pine grove that day, I carried the water pot and waited at the proper place for his return. On his way back, when he found me standing there with the water pot, he said, Now, look here. Why did you do such a thing? Why did you come with the water pot? How can I accept water from your hand? Can I accept service from you? I honor your father as a guru. I was struck with wonder. Only then did I realize why he would not allow me to render service to him. The master had infinite moods. How could we fathom them? We can understand only that which he allows us to understand. The master's words were so impressive and instructive that I felt tempted to take notes. One day at Dakshineswar, I was listening to him and looking intently at his face. He was explaining many beautiful things. Noticing my keen interest, the master suddenly said, Look here. Why are you listening so attentively? I was taken by surprise. He then added, You don't have to do that. Your life is different. I felt as if the master had divined my intention to keep notes and did not approve of it, and that was why he had spoken in that way. From that time on I gave up the idea of taking notes of his conversations, and whatever notes I already had I threw into the Ganges.14 sometime in the middle of 1883, Tarak's wife, Nitikli, fell ill and died. Tarak performed the customary ritual for his departed wife, then resigned from his job and decided to lead the life of a monk. When Tarak told his father of his determination, tears began to trickle down his father's cheeks. Ramkanai asked Tarak to salute their family deity in the shrine and then blessed him, placing his hand on his son's head, May you realize God. I myself tried to renounce the world and realize Him, but I failed. Therefore I bless you that you may attain God. When Tarak told the Master about this, he was quite pleased to hear it and said, It is good that this has happened. Tarak was first amongst the disciples to renounce worldly attachments. He lived mostly with Ramakrishna during the last three years of the Master's life. Sometimes he would live at Dakshineswar and sometimes the master would arrange for him to stay at Ram's house in Calcutta. Tarak cooked his own food and practiced meditation in some solitary parks, Bidon Square and Hedua in central Calcutta or in the cremation ground, Keoratla Ghat at South Calcutta. 
He also lived for some time at Kankurgachi Yogodhyana, Ram's retreat in East Calcutta. I was so happy there all by myself, recalled Tarak. For lunch I used to procure from the neighborhood a little rice and one or two simple dishes. For supper I prepared over the open dhuni fire, a fire used by wandering monks, a few pieces of unleavened bread and roasted an eggland or a couple of green bananas. And I ate only these, washing them down with drinks of water. Day and night I used to be absorbed in my spiritual practice beside the dhuni fire and right there snatched my sleep and rest. The fire would sometimes attract snakes, but for some reason or other they avoided me. Fifteen from time to time Tarak would visit the master at Dakshineswar. On 8th June 1883 when Tarak arrived, Ramakrishna was in the mother's temple. He was pleased to see Tarak and showed his affection by touching his chin. In addition to guiding the disciple, the real Guru also protects him from evil influence. The Master knew that Tarak was very close to Nitya Gopal, who often experienced ecstasy during Kirtan, devotional singing, and at the same time mixed freely with women. One day the Master privately told Tarak, Look, don't be too close to Nitya Gopal. His path is different, he does not belong to this place. Tarak immediately stopped associating with him. Another time a Vaishnav monk, whose order accepted Krishna but not Radha, came to Dakshineswar. He was a good sadhu but very dry. Seeing that Tarak was visiting him often, the master cautioned him, his philosophy may be good but it does not appeal to me. I love God as well as His Leela. Divine play. Dot 16 Tarak at once withdrew himself from that monk. In February 1884, Sri Ramakrishna had an accident. One day Tarak came and inquired about the master's health. In reply, he smilingly said, One night in the garden, as I was looking at the moon, my feet became entangled in the wire fence and I fell down, fracturing my left wrist. The after-effect is still there, and they have bandaged me tightly. They refuse to take the bandage off. I can hardly call on my Divine Mother with comfort. Tell me, does one enjoy calling on the Mother in such a predicament? Sometimes I feel, what nonsense is this? Let me out of this body, snapping all ties. Then again I think, no, let the pleasant play of the Mother continue. There is fun in this too, 17. After hearing this, Tarak said, Sir, you can certainly heal yourself if you so wish. The master replied, What? I can cure myself by a mere wish. The master paused a while, then continued, No, aches and pains of sickness are preferable. Sickness scares away worldly people who visit here with ulterior motives, and I am left alone. The next moment he talked to the Divine Mother, Mother, you have made a wonderful device. He then began to sing a devotional song and went into Samadhi. After a while the Master regained his normal consciousness and talked to the Mother again like a petulant child, Mother, you were never born. So how can you understand the pain of embodiment? 18. In 1884 Tarak went on a short pilgrimage to Vrindavan, the childhood playground of Krishna. On 7th September 1884, he visited the master, carrying with him some sacred dust and prasad that he had brought from the holy city. By the middle of 1885, Sri Ramakrishna had developed throat cancer. On 20th September 1885, he was in his room at Dakshineswar when a physician from Calcutta came to examine him. The master asked the devotees, well, people ask why, if I am such a holy person, I should be ill. Tarak replied, Bhagavan Das Babaji, too, was ill and bedridden a long time. The master objected, but look at Dr. Madhu. At the age of sixty he carries food to the house of his mistress, and he has no illness. A devotee said, Sir, 
your illness is for the sake of others. You take upon yourself the sins of those who come to you. When a devotee asked the master to tell the mother to cure his disease, the master replied, I cannot ask God to cure my disease. On 26th September 1885, Sri Ramakrishna was taken to Calcutta for treatment. He stayed at a house in Shampukur till 11th December and then was moved to the Kos Sipore Garden House. Tarak joined the other brother disciples there to serve the Master. He later reminisced. Sri Ramakrishna was seriously ill and was staying at the Kos Sipore Garden House while under treatment. Most of us were living there with him to nurse him. Taking turns, we waited on him day and night. Surendra, a well-to-do householder devotee, arranged for all the necessities. A cook had been engaged, but when he fell ill, we had to take turns cooking. Our meals were very plain, usually consisting of rice or unleavened bread, lentils, vegetables, soup or similar dishes. We were in such a mental state that we didn't pay any attention to food at all. We ate whatever we could get. In the first place, the master was terribly sick and secondly we were all deeply absorbed in severe spiritual disciplines. One night it was my turn to cook for the household. As I was adding the final spices to the vegetables, the smell spread through the house and reached the master upstairs. He asked the nearby attendant, what is cooking? Excellent! The aroma of the spices is everywhere. Who is the cook? When he learned that I was the cook, he said, Go and bring me a little of it, and he tasted a tiny bit of the preparation. Because of the cancer in his throat, he could hardly swallow anything. With great difficulty, he would eat a little farina cooked in milk, but most of the time he was not able to swallow even that dot twenty sometime in the middle of January 1886, the elder Gopal wanted to distribute twelve pieces of ochre cloth and rosaries to some monks. The master pointed to his young disciples and said, You won't find better monks than these. Give your cloths and rosaries to them. Instead, Gopal offered them to the master, and he himself distributed them among his young disciples. Tarak received an ochre cloth, the garb of a monk, directly from the master. Apart from serving the master, the disciples began to practice various kinds of sadhanas, spiritual disciplines, under his guidance. Sometimes Tarak would spend the whole night in meditation in the Panchavati grove at Dakshineswar and then would return to Kos Sipore in the morning. In the early part of 1886, Narendra, Tarak and some other disciples began to study the life and teachings of Buddha and were captivated by his renunciation, forbearance, love and compassion. One night in the early part of April, without informing anyone, Narendra, Tarak and Kali left for Bodh Gaya, where Buddha attained Nirvana. After arriving at Bodh Gaya, they spent days in meditation under the famous Bodhi tree where Buddha attained enlightenment. On the third night Narendra felt an intense longing for Buddha. He was overwhelmed by emotion and burst into tears, tenderly embracing Tarak, who was meditating next to him. It is said that Narendra saw Buddha enter into Tarak's body. While they were in Gaya, the other disciples were worried about them, but the master kept quiet. When the three returned to Kosipore, the master, moving his index finger in a circle and waving his thumb, said, No spirituality anywhere. Then pointing to himself, he said, This time all is here. You may roam about wherever you please, but you will not find anything, spirituality, anywhere. Here all the doors are open, 21 days of austerity, and pilgrimages Sri Ramakrishna passed away on 16th August 1886 and his young disciples were grief-stricken. At first, they thought that the master was in Samadhi, so they chanted the Lord's name for the whole night. 
The next day Dr. Mahendralal Sarkar came to examine Sri Ramakrishna and declared that he was dead. In the afternoon the disciples carried the body to the Kos Sipore cremation ground and after the cremation brought the master's relics back to the Kos Sipore garden house. They decided to place the relics on the altar and continue worshipping Sri Ramakrishna. Holy Mother gave her approval of the plan. Tarak, Latu and the elder Gopal stayed at the Kos Sipore garden house as they had no other place to go. The other disciples came during the day to talk about the Master. Because the young disciples had to vacate the garden house by the end of August and had no means to rent a place for worship, Ramchandra Datta suggested that they install the Master's relics at his retreat in Kankurgachi. The helpless disciples had to yield to this, but they secretly took away the major portion of the relics in an urn, which they kept at the house of Balaram Basu. One day about this time Sri Ramakrishna appeared before Surendranath Mitra, a rich and generous devotee, and asked him to provide a place for the disciples to live and worship. Surendra joyfully told Narendra about his vision, suggested that he create a centre, and agreed to pay all necessary expenses. Very soon the disciples established the Ramakrishna monastery at Barnagore, which was between Dakshineswar and Kakata. Tarak and the elder Gopal were the first to live full-time in the monastery. During December 1886, Tarak and some other disciples went to Antpur, the country home of Baburam. Inspired by Narendra, they took informal vows of monasticism during a night-long vigil around a sacred fire. Later they discovered that their vigil had taken place on Christmas Eve. A month later they took formal monastic vows, performing the traditional Virajahoma fire ceremony in Barnagore. Narendra gave the name Swami Shivananda to Tarak, knowing his Shivalike nature. Sri Ramakrishna bound his disciples with a cord of love. Shivananda later remarked, We had so much deep love for each other that we were ready to sacrifice our lives for each other. From the very inception of the Ramakrishna Math, the disciples tried to create a spiritual atmosphere through their austerities, japam, meditation, devotional singing, and scriptural study. Shivananda lived at Barnagore for about two and a half years, developing his own spiritual life and helping to consolidate the new monastery. He nursed monks who fell ill and did household work, such as cutting vegetables for cooking, carrying water from the Ganges, sweeping and dusting the rooms, and even cleaning the toilets. In the beginning of 1889, Shivananda felt an urge to lead the free, detached life of an itinerant monk. He left for Kedamath and Badrinarayan, to famous Himalayan holy places. It was a long and arduous journey. During those days pilgrims had to walk hundreds of miles on foot. On the way he visited several holy places in northern India. He was overjoyed to see the perpetual snow range of the Kedar Peak, 23,000 feet, the shrine itself was at 12,000 feet above sea level. After staying there a few days, he left for Badrinarayan. Shivananda wrote to Brahmananda, It has been four days since I arrived at Badrinarayan, a beautiful place situated right on the bank of the river Alkananda, surrounded by snow peaks. Here the Alkananda flows through snow. In certain spots the river is so wholly covered with snow that the water is not visible at all. While coming to Badrinarayan, I had to walk over snow part of the way, sometimes as long a distance as half a mile. And yet this place does not seem to be so dreadfully cold as Kedarnath. Twenty-two Shivananda stayed there for a few days and attended the worship service of Lord Vishnu. Of the mountains I am the Himalayas, said Krishna in the Gita. On the top of this vast, panoramic mountain range, in the depth of its caves and on the banks of its rivers, the rishis of ancient India lived and discovered the truths of Vedanta. Monks therefore find great joy in visiting the holy places of the Himalayas. 
After visiting Badrinath, Shivananda went to Almora, in another part of the Himalayas. On the way to Srinagar, he met Gangadhar, later Swami Akhandananda, who had come down from Tibet. On seeing each other after such a long time, the brother disciples embraced and wept for joy. Shivananda asked Gangadhar to return to Barnagore Math, but he declined and returned to Tibet. During his stay in Almora, Shivananda met some sincere seekers of truth and talked to them about spiritual life. Lala Badrishah Thalgoria, a rich local merchant, became an ardent devotee and welcomed Shivananda to his home. He was way happy to serve Shivananda, but he was unhappy that he did not have a son to maintain his family line. One day Lalaji humbly asked Shivananda to bless him so that he would have a son. Pleased with his devotion and sendi, the Swami prayed to the Lord. By God's grace, in due course a male child was born. Badrisha named him Siddhadas, a servant of the saint. Later, Badrishah's Almora home became the residence for visiting Ramakrishna monks, including Swami Vivekananda. Towards the end of 1889, Shivananda returned to the Barnagore monastery and stayed there two years. In October 1891, he again left on a pilgrimage and visited Prayag at the confluence of the Ganges and Jamuna rivers, Omkarnath Shiva, on the bank of the river Narmada, Tan Chavti, on the bank of the river Godavari in central India, Bombay, and Pune. He practiced austerities in all these places. In the early part of 1892, the Barnagore monastery was moved to Alambazar. During the time of Sri Ramakrishna's birth anniversary, Shivananda returned to Alambazar and received the sad news that his father had passed away. Towards the end of March 1892, Shivananda and Ramakrishnananda went to visit Kamrapukur, the birthplace of Sri Ramakrishna, and Jairambati, the birthplace of Holy Mother. The Swamis met some people who had personally known Ramakrishna, and they heard many stories about him. Hearing the sweet reminiscences of Sri Ramakrishna's boyhood days and seeing the places associated with him made him alive in their minds. Out of devotion they rolled on the dusty courtyard of Ramakrishna's parental home. Both Swamis also stayed with Holy Mother at Jarambati and cooked for her one day. Unfortunately, Shivananda contracted malarial fever as soon as he partially recovered both the Swamis returned to Alambajar. At the end of 1892 Shivananda again left the monastery and visited Kurukshetra near Delhi where Krishna delivered the message of the Gita to Arjuna. He then visited Jwalamukhi, Saro and other holy places in the northwestern part of India. He later recalled, In those days I felt great restlessness and longing to realize God. While walking I would practice the recollectedness of God and pray to Him earnestly. I disliked the company of people and avoided roads ordinarily frequented by travellers. Towards evening I found shelter somewhere and spent the night absorbed in my own thoughts. If a person lives this way, having no possessions, he develops full resignation to God. He becomes established in the idea that God alone is his protector in prosperity as well as in adversity. 23. The Himalayas had a special attraction for Shivananda. In the middle of 1893, he returned to Almora and stayed several months. While there he met E. T. Sturdy, a young English theosophist, who was leading the life of a Hindu monk and practicing Raja Yoga. He was greatly attracted to Shivananda's personality and later heard about Viveka, Nanda's success in America. Upon his return to England, he invited Vivekananda there and made all the arrangements for him to preach Vedanta. On 2nd October 1893, Shivananda left Almora for Rameswaram, which is in South India on the shore of the Indian Ocean. On his way, he visited Agra, Vrindavan, Jaipur, Abu and Bombay, finally arriving in Madras. 
In the meantime, the news of Vivekananda's success at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago had reached India. Swamiji's followers were delighted to have Shivananda in Madras and showed him Swamiji's inspiring letters written to them from America. From Madras, Shivananda visited the most important holy places in South India, Kachi, Chidambaram, Bangalore, Madurai, Rameswaram, and Sri Rangam. After attending the Ramakrishna birth anniversary festival with the Madras devotees, Shivananda returned to the Alambazar Monastery. Swamiji wrote from America praising Shivananda's work in Madras. Sometimes traditional monks observe a vow called Chaturmasya. During the rainy season, they stay in one place for four months and practice intense sadhana. Shivananda decided to go to Uttarkashi, a remote part of the Himalayas, to observe Chaturmasya. Uttarkashi is a lovely place on the bank of the Ganges where many hermits live, but in those days few people went to Uttarkashi because of its inaccessibility. Shivananda found a small cottage on the Ganges and begged for food once a day. Most of the time he remained absorbed in japam and meditation. It is always good to hear directly from a seeker of God about the struggle and hardship of his spiritual journey. Later Shivananda recalled, This body did a lot of mountain climbing, visited many places, and practiced much austerity. There were times when I did not have more than one piece of cloth with me. Many nights I slept under a tree. I had a feeling of great dispassion and never thought about physical comfort, finding joy in austerity alone. I wandered a great deal, carrying no possessions, but was never in any trouble. The Master stayed by me and protected me from all dangers and difficulties, and I never went hungry. 24 In the early part of 1895, he went to visit Khanderao Baba at Brahmavarta, or Vithur, near Kanpur. That monk had practiced austerity for 10, 146 times. God lived with them 38 years at one spot on the bank of the Ganges. Speaking with him, Shivananda realized that he was a knower of Brahman. The Swami also met great souls like Trilanga Swami, Swami Bhaskarananda, Chameli Puri and Magniram Brahmachari in Varanasi. I was on my way to Vithur to see a holy man, recalled Shivananda later. At noon I was resting under a tree. Till then I had no food and there was no village nearby either. In the meantime, a big ripe bull fruit fell from a bull tree and cracked open near me. I looked around and found no one. Then I picked up that bull fruit and ate it, which was my meal for the day. 25 Swami Vividishnanda wrote in A Man of God. For over a decade, the Swami travelled in different parts of India, sometimes in the Himalayas, sometimes on the plains and sometimes in deserts or forests, and always he lived a life worthy of a man of God. Mahapurush had experienced Samadhi three times as a young man during the lifetime of the Master. The austerities and meditations of his itinerant period established him in that blessed state, enriching his life and giving him the necessary depth and strength to shoulder the responsibilities of the great task ahead of him. On the anvil of those years and the ones in which he began doing works of service were forged the character and personality later adored as Mahapurush, the head of the order, who constantly lived in God and overflowed with love and blessings to all. 26 With Swami Vivekananda in February 1896, Shivananda returned to Alambazar Monastery. In the meantime, Vivekananda had written from America, exhorting his brother disciples to stay together, inspiring them to spread the message of Ramakrishna all over India and to perform philanthropic activities among the impoverished masses in India. Shivananda responded accordingly. Once he explained the philosophy behind his work, the Master does his own work. You and I are only instruments. Fix your mind on him 
He will make you do what is to be done. Work done out of ego accomplishes nothing. What good does it do to the world? He who has performed much austerity, God makes him an instrument and works through him. He only works in the right spirit. Work that lacks the spirit is a waste of energy. 27. In January 1897 Vivekananda arrived in South India. Shivananda went to Madurai to receive him. Shivananda later wrote about this trip. To receive Swamiji some monks of our order, including myself, were at the Madurai station. Alighting from the royal carriage lent by the Raja of Ramnad, Swamiji greeted us by embracing us warmly. All of us were lodged at the state guest house. In the afternoon the leading citizens of the city gathered at the Madurai College and presented Swamiji with an address of welcome, to which he gave a reply. That was the first time I heard him speak publicly, and I was certainly struck by his gift of speech. Hitherto we had lived and travelled together, but never had I seen him manifest such dynamic eloquence. He had a wonderful command of the English language, and when he spoke he gave one the impression that he was speaking in his own mother tongue. In Madras Swamiji stayed for about five or six, actually nine, days and gave as many public lectures. Then, accompanied by a few disciples from Madras, Swamiji boarded a steamer bound for Calcutta. His Western disciples and we his brothers were also in the party. On board the steamer Swamiji had animated religious discussions with some Christian missionary passengers who learned a great deal from him. The deck of the steamer became, as it were, an auditorium attracting the entire passenger community. Finally, Swamiji arrived in Calcutta where he was given a tremendous public ovation. In Calcutta he gave two or three public lectures. After a long time we were again together at the math with Swamiji. Words fail to describe the joy we had in his company in those days. 28 After arriving in Calcutta, Vivekananda was exhausted and became ill from overwork. He left for Darjeeling, a Himalayan resort, for a rest. Shivananda again went to Almora for sadhana and he was advised by Swamiji to start a centre there, which came into existence in 1916. From Darjeeling, Vivekananda returned to Calcutta and established the Ramakrishna Mission on 1 May 1897, and on 6 May he left for Almora to rest, accompanied by Shivananda. One day in Almora, Swamiji taught Shivananda how to read other people's minds. Then at the request of Swamiji, Shivananda went to Sri Lanka to preach Vedanta and stayed there for about seven to eight months. He conducted classes on the Bhagavad Gita and Raja Yoga, which were attended by many educated Hindus and Europeans. Shivananda trained Mrs. Pickett, a capable and serious Western student, and then sent her to teach Vedanta in Australia and New Zealand. During his stay in Sri Lanka, the Swami visited various famous temples, including the Tooth Temple, where Buddha's teeth are enshrined. In February 1898, Shivananda returned to Calcutta. Later, a monk asked Shivananda whether he liked Sri Lanka or not. Shivananda replied, I am happy everywhere. I never feel discontented in any place. If one can live in God, one can be happy anywhere. 29. On 13 February 1898, the Ramakrishna Math was moved from Alambazar to Nilambar Babu's garden house in Belur. The disciples purchased a piece of land at Belur on the bank of the Ganges on which to build the future headquarters of the Ramakrishna order. On 27 February, Swamiji carried the relics of Sri Ramakrishna to the new site and worshipped the Master. Shivananda and other disciples and devotees of the Master were present on that auspicious occasion. Finally, on 2 January 1899, the monastery was moved from the rented house to Belur Math. 
Swamiji announced that all monks should join in daily scripture class in the monastery. Shivananda took an active part in these classes and would answer the questions of the monks. The following are some questions and answers from these sessions. 14th March 1898 Question Why does truth suffer from persecution so often at the hands of opponents? Shivananda, truth can never suffer, for it is transcendental, not physical. We see the body suffer, not the real person. Persecution, instead of hurting the truth, always brings out its pristine glory all the more. 15th April 1898 Question How can it be proved that this world is unreal and Brahman alone is real? Shivananda, if we observe closely the changeableness of things outside as well as within, we can be convinced of the unreality of the entire world. Every change perceived by the senses as happening outside has its counterpart within us. In proportion as the outer world is changeable, so is the inner world. By the reality of a thing is meant truly its existence at all times eternally. Unfortunately, in this world of phenomena there is nothing that remains unchanged even for a second. Now with the idea of finding the ultimate truth, if we push our analysis further, we shall see that at the back of all changeable phenomena is the immutable Brahman. First, gross objects, then subtle and subtler objects, whatever we analyze in the outer world, we fail to find any permanence in them. Baffled, we finally turn within ourselves. This self-withdrawal or abstraction is the only way to the knowledge of Brahman or the Supreme Reality. 30 Vivekananda made a rule in the monastery that all monks would have to get up at 4 a.m. and then after washing, meditate in the shrine, otherwise they would have to beg for alms that day. One day Shivananda did not hear the bell and, as a result, missed the morning meditation. Swamiji noticed this and later said to him, Tarakda, we made the rule that those who did not come to the shrine would have to live on arms that day. Shivananda replied, Of course, I am leaving the monastery right now for arms and whatever I shall get that I will eat. After Shivananda left to beg for arms, the food was offered to the master in the shrine as usual and the lunch bell was rung, but Swamiji did not go to the dining hall. Instead, he waited on the western veranda. When Shivananda returned, Swamiji joyfully asked, Tarakda, what did you bring? I have not eaten any food obtained by begging for a long time. It is customary in India for monks to live on food obtained by begging from door to door as bees collect honey from flower to flower. Let us share the food and eat together. The two brother disciples happily enjoyed that pure food. 31 Sri Ramakrishna trained his disciples to be organized in their actions, and he insisted that they keep each thing. In .its underscore proper place dot accordingly, Swami Vivekananda made it rule in Belur Math that anyone who smoked a hubble bubble should put it back in a particular place after smoking and not just leave it here or there. One day a hubble bubble was found on the front veranda of the monastery. Swamiji became angry when he saw it. When he inquired who had left it there, Someone told him that it was Swami Shivananda. Immediately Swamiji called him in a loud voice, Tarakda. Hearing Swamiji's thundering voice, all were scared, even Swami Shivananda. No sooner had the Swami arrived than Swamiji threw the hubble bubble on the floor and broke it into pieces. Then he said to Swami Shivananda, Now you collect money, buy a new hubble bubble and keep it in its proper place. 32 Vivekananda went to the West again in June 1899 and returned to India in December 1900. After arriving at Belur Math, Swamiji heard the sad news of Mr. Sevius' death in Mayavati, Himalayas. Accompanied by Shivananda and Sadananda, Swamiji left for Mayavati to console Mrs. Sevius. 
It was a bad winter with a great deal of snow and rain, and Mayavati was 65 miles away from the Katkodam railroad station. They reached Mayavati on 3rd January. After staying there for a couple of weeks, they returned to the plains. At Pilibhit, Swamiji asked Shivananda to spread the Master's message in that area and to raise some money for the monastery. During this time Shivananda travelled to various places in Uttar Pradesh and towards the end of 1901, he went to Kankhal to help Swami Kalyanananda. In February 1902 when Swamiji went to Varanasi to improve his health, Shivananda stayed with him and then returned to Belur Math. Later Shivananda reminisced with the monks, a couple of weeks before Swamiji's passing away, we were standing beneath the mango tree in the courtyard. Swamiji came down from the shrine. Having a prophetic vision, he said, Look, the spiritual current of this place will continue for seven to eight hundred years. We are witnessing a little, you will see more in the future. Believe in my words. The Master and the Divine Mother are guiding this order. 33 While Swamiji was in Varanasi, the Maharaja of Dhinga invited Swamiji to his palace and offered him 500 rupees to start a center in Varanasi. Swamiji didn't accept the money at that time, but he later asked Shivananda to go to Varanasi and start a center there. Shivananda left Belur Math in the fourth week of June. Swamiji died on 4th July 1902 at Varanasi. From 1902 to 1909, Shivananda concentrated on establishing a permanent center in Varanasi with the Maharaja's help. He named the center Sri Ramakrishna Advait Ashrama with the idea that one can be established in Advait, non-duality, by molding oneself on the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. He decided to preach Vedanta by practicing it in daily life rather than by lecturing about it from the pulpit. He practiced severe austerities in Varanasi and set an example for others. When he experienced no communion with God he would lament. One day he said to Swami Nirbharananda, Chandra, this day is gone in vain. Neither have I seen the Master today nor have I shed tears for him, 34 a monk wrote in his diary about Shivananda's daily life. His bed was a blanket and a tiger skin. Even in cold winter he would sleep on the floor of the hall, first spreading straw and the tiger skin over it and then covering himself with a blanket. Sometimes at 2 a.m. he would sit for meditation near the fireplace. In the morning he would open the shrine and then he would chant for a long time from the Gita, Chandi and Upanishads. Afterwards, supervising the household work, he would take his bath and perform ritualistic worship. Whatever food was available, he would offer to the master and he lived on that prasad with others. There was no arrangement for special food. He seldom would go out of the ashrama. He was absorbed in his own mood, and sometimes he would sing in a low voice. He would meditate in the afternoon also. After vespers, he would remain absorbed in meditation till the food was offered to the master. He was so grave that we were afraid to talk to him. 35. When the Maharaja's donation, 500 rupees, was exhausted, the ashrama faced a terrible financial crisis. Unfortunately, when Shivananda collected 100 rupees to pay the house rent, that money was stolen by an employee. Shivananda was then reproached by the landlord for not paying the rent. Later, it was arranged for the rent to be paid in installments. Gradually, when the people came to know about the Swami and his financial difficulties, they began to help him. Shivananda opened a free nursery school in the ashrama for poor children and he also distributed Vivekananda's lectures printed in Hindi. Many scholars of Varanasi visited the Swami and learned from his personal spiritual experience. In spite of his stern exterior, 
he would serve the monks like a loving mother. Once he said to a senior monk, You know, the boys living here are like young cobras, which means they possess the same deadly poison as a mature cobra. You should not belittle them. Those who have taken refuge in the Master are great, 36 in Belur Math and other places in 1909 Shivananda handed over the management of the Varanasi Advat Ashrama to his assistant monk and returned to Belur Math. Although Swami Brahmananda was the president, Swami Premananda managed the monastery. When Premananda visited Calcutta or other places, Shivananda would perform ritualistic worship and manage the monastery in his place. Regarding his worship at Belur, he once said, Our worship in the shrine was more an act of love and devotion, having none of the external grandeur of ritualistic observances as is prevalent now. While doing the worship, we would think of the Master as visibly present, just as we had seen him at Dakshineswar in his room seated on his cot, we would worship him, following the simplest procedure. Although we observed some of the orthodox rules and forms, we never stressed them. Sri Ramakrishna is the Lord of our hearts, and what he wants from us is genuine devotion and self-dedication. 37 Swami Atulananda, a Western Swami then known as Gurudas, Recalled, I met the Swami, Shivananda, at the western tea veranda of the main monastery building at Belur on the very day when I arrived from America. He was seated on a bench smoking his hubble bubble. There were several other monks besides a number of devotees present at the place. After introduction and exchange of greetings, the Swami was kind enough to make me sit beside him on the bench, a signal honour. Referring to the peculiar sound produced by the Hubble bubble, he joked and wanted me to believe that there was a live frog inside that made the noise. Then showing me how to smoke the Hubble bubble, he was gracious enough to let me use his own pipe. At the time I took the incident rather casually, because in our society smoking is an everyday affair involving no etiquette or ceremony. Besides, I thought of the incident as a plain joke, never realizing that it could have any other meaning. But later as I became better acquainted with Hindu society and its customs, it dawned upon me that by letting me use his own pipe Mahapurush paved the way for my easy acceptance as a member, in addition to making a gesture of endearment. 38 Shortly before Sri Ramakrishna's birth anniversary in 1910, Lady Minto, the wife of the then Viceroy and Governor General of India, paid a visit to Belur Math. Shivananda received her cordially and showed her around the monastery. Lady Minto was under the impression that it was Swami Vivekananda who had founded the Ramakrishna Order. But Shivananda told her, neither Vivekananda nor the disciples founded the order. It was Sri Ramakrishna himself who initiated the order during his last illness at Kosipore. At that time the master took Swamiji aside and taught him how to organize and conduct the work, telling him the secrets of the monastic organization to be, 39 Lady Minto was surprised to hear this. In the same year Shivananda, Turiyananda, Premananda, and Brahmachari Gurudas went to Amarnath, the famous ice cave in Kashmir. It was a difficult pilgrimage. After spending three months in Kashmir and visiting various places, Shivananda returned to Varanasi, where he contracted blood dysentery. When he returned to Belur Math, he was again attacked by dysentery. He was then sent to Calcutta for treatment where he recuperated after a prolonged illness. Later he adopted a very strict diet, which he followed all through his life. Day after day he ate plain rice with bland soup without complaint. He truly followed that famous saying of the Bhagavata, he who has controlled the tongue has controlled everything. Sardananda humorously named that tasteless, odorless soup, Mahapurush soup.
After Sri Ramakrishna's birth anniversary in 1912, Shivananda, Brahmananda and Turiyananda went to Kankhal, Hardwar and stayed seven months. The monastic community was inspired by the disciples who told them stories of their Guru, Sri Ramakrishna. This oral tradition of spirituality is vital to the growth of the younger generation in the order and is generally lacking in organized religion. Moreover, religious festivals, devotional singing and spiritual discourses remove the monotony of life. Brahmananda arranged for the celebration of Durga Puja in the ashrama and invited many monks from outside the Ramakrishna order. When not travelling, Shivananda would answer letters from the devotees. On 15th July 1912 he wrote, Continue your japam and meditation as usual. It will not do any harm to you. First place a picture of Sri Ramakrishna in front of you. Then close your eyes and imagine that form in your heart. Pray to Him with earnest love and meditate on His divine qualities in the following way. He is Satchidananda, existence knowledge bliss absolute. Now He has been born as a human being to clear the path of liberation for humankind as He did in previous ages. In this age He Himself has taken the form of Ramakrishna and awakened faith and devotion in many, He is doing the same at present and will do so in the future. He is our Father, Mother, Friend, Guru are all in all. Thus surrender yourself to Him. 40 On 16th June 1913 Shivananda went to Almora at the invitation of Paltukar, a householder devotee of the Master. He lived there for a year and a half, talking to the devotees about spiritual life and practicing sadhana. During this time, he wrote some wonderful letters that indicated his mental condition. Here are some excerpts. 17th September 1913, You have asked me, What do I desire, the Lord or liberation? My answer, the Lord. You also desire the Lord, if you find Him. Liberation will be assured like the fruit in the palm. 41 30th October 1914. There is not any particular special method to call on God, only try to love Him. If you ask, How shall I love Him? The answer is this When you cannot stay without calling on Him, without thinking of Him, then only you know that He is loving you. If He does not love, none can love Him. He is our all in all in life as well as in death. 42 On 6th November 1914, Shivananda returned to Varanasi and met Brahmananda, Premananda, and Turiyananda. When the disciples came together, they talked about the Master and their experiences. This would uplift the spirits of the young monks and devotees. One day, a devotee lamented to Shivananda about his sinful life. The Swami replied, Haven't you heard Sri Ramakrishna's words on this subject? He used to say, Sins are like a mountain of cotton. Even as a tiny spark of fire reduces to ashes mountain high cotton, so does a little of divine grace reduce to nothing heaps of sins. Don't be afraid. Call upon the Lord and repeat His sacred and potent name. Nothing else will be needed. 43. In November 1914, Shivananda returned to Belur Math. After Ramakrishna's birth anniversary, in the spring of 1915, the Swami went to Ranchi to attend the Ramakrishna festival. A devotee reminisced. The Swami was here only for three or four days, and yet during that short time He gave us such heavenly joy. As he was recounting some intimate incidents from the lives of Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother, a devotee said in a note of sadness, Maharaj, we merely hear about the Master, we do not have the good fortune of seeing Him with our eyes. Quickly the Swami rejoined, Why? He who hath seen the Son, hath seen the Father. I and my Father are one. Startled by his statement, we stood there looking at him with admiration. 
His solemn words are still echoing in our ears. 44 After returning to Belur Math from Ranchi, Shivananda again left for Almora on 8 April 1915. Shivananda accompanied Turiyananda, who was then suffering from diabetes. It was thought that the Himalayan climate would be beneficial for his health. Shivananda's loving care and arrangement of proper diet considerably improved Turiyananda's health. This time Shivananda concentrated on building a permanent ashrama in Almora as he had been asked to do by Swamiji. A piece of land was purchased and construction was started with the help of local devotees. To collect more funds and building materials, he came down to Varanasi on 5th November 1915 and finally returned to Belur Math on 5th March 1916 via Prayag. In 1916 and 1917 Premananda was busy travelling and preaching in East Bengal and from time to time he became ill. During his absence Shivananda managed the Belur Monastery. When the ailing Premananda died in 1918, Shivananda lamented, I felt in my heart an emptiness that cannot be described in words. Many times I was tempted to go back to the Himalayas and remain there absorbed in a transcendental spiritual state, in Samadhi beyond all relative categories, having nothing to do with the world anymore. 45. But this wish of Shivananda's was never fulfilled because he had to take complete responsibility for the management of the monastery. The disciples of Sri Ramakrishna were genuine role models. They trained monks by setting the routine for meditation, scriptural study and karma yoga. As soon as the shrine door was open in the morning, Shivananda would go in to meditate and would remain there till 7 a.m. After returning to his room, he would greet the monks and inspire them with spiritual conversation. He would also inquire about their health and welfare. Shivananda kept a vigilant eye on the master's worship service and food offering, the flower and vegetable gardens, the dairy, and the welfare of the neighbors. Sometimes he would visit the Belur Math headquarters and give advice to the trustees. Since the earliest days, Belur Math has conducted a free clinic and dispensary for the benefit of poor neighbors as well as monastics. The monk in charge of the clinic recalled. It was the rainy season. All around there was sickness, especially malarial fever. The number of outside patients visiting the clinic was growing fast. To make the situation worse, the compounder, pharmacist, assisting me fell ill. I found it very difficult to manage the work alone. One day Mahapurush dropped in at the clinic and after hearing the report of the work said, I see that you are having a hard time doing the work by yourself. Shall I help you a little? In reply I said, Why, Maharaj? No, that is not necessary. Please bless me that I may manage it myself. There was no end to his worries when anyone happened to be sick at the math. He would insist on having reports twice or thrice a day, eager to know how the patients were doing. Ah! How concerned he was for us! How deep was his love for us! 46. Shivananda's lifestyle was very simple. He regularly wrote letters to the monks and devotees himself. In the afternoons he would meet with devotees and answer their spiritual questions or talk about his days with the Master and Swamiji. He would attend the Vesper service and afterwards meditate in the shrine. He would partake of the Master's prasad and plain food along with other monks. His clothing was also very simple. Until 1922 he had two pieces of cloth, a short-sleeved shirt, a chadar and one pair of slippers. He had another set of clothing and shoes that he used while visiting Calcutta and other places. In July 1920, Holy Mother passed away in Calcutta and her body was cremated in Belur Math. Shivananda suppressed his own grief. 
and consoled the devotees. On 12th August 1920 he wrote in a letter, He who feels more keenly the loss of the mother will certainly see her more within, thereby enjoying genuine peace. She was not an ordinary woman or a seeker on the path, not even one of those who attained the goal. She was verily a manifestation of the Divine Mother, the primal energy, ever perfect. She is indeed the Mother of the Universe, the same as the dormant spiritual power, the indwelling spirit in every living being. Blessed is the devotee who received initiation from her and had a taste of her utterly selfless love. The devotee who even once felt the touch of her loving hands in blessing is bound to be spiritually awakened if he is not already awakened. This is my sincere conviction. 47. On 6th February 1921, Mahatma Gandhi and his wife, Motilal Nehru, Muhammad Ali, and other national leaders visited Belur Math during the birthday celebration of Swami Vivekananda. Shivananda received them cordially and took them to the shrine and the room where Vivekananda had lived and passed away. Shivananda thought very highly of Gandhi because of his sincerity of purpose, sacrifice and love for the masses of India. Gandhi showed keen interest in the activities of the monastery and touched some of the relics of Sri Ramakrishna with devotion. Seeing a huge crowd in the monastery courtyard, Gandhi gave a short talk. Please do not think for a moment that I have come here with the idea of preaching my doctrine of non-cooperation and the spinning wheel. I am here to offer my humble homage and salutations to the sacred memory of Swami Vivekananda on his birthday. I have studied Swamiji's writings well. As a result, my love for India has grown. To the youth of the country I have this appeal, Please do not leave empty-handed the monastery where Swamiji lived, moved, and died without accepting some of his great ideas. 48 On 1 April 1921, Shivananda left for South India with Brahmananda, who had been invited to open the students' home in Madras. On the way, they stopped at Bhuvneshwar and Vaitair and arrived in Madras on 25th April. On 14th June they went to Bangalore, where they stayed nearly four months. On 11th September Shivananda wrote to a monk, I went to Mysore for a few days. There I visited the vast shrine of Mother Chamundi on the top of a hill and recited the Chandi, the glory of the Divine Mother. From there one visited the temple of Narayana in Melkot, 32 miles from Mysore, where Ramanuj began to preach his philosophy of qualified non-dualism. It is one of the main holy places of the Vaishnavas, 49 about the goddess Chamundi he said later, Ah! The mother is vibrantly living there. Through her grace I had a wonderful darshan, vision, 50 from Bangalore, Shivananda and Brahmananda returned to Madras. They attended Durga Puja and Kali Puja in Madras, then left for Bhuvneshwar on 19th November and finally returned to Belur Math on 12th January 1922. On 10th November 1921, Swami Abhedananda had returned permanently to Belur Math from America. Shivananda and Brahmananda were happy to see Abhedananda after 15 years. In the meantime, the devotees of East Bengal invited Shivananda to visit Dhaka. On 13th February 1922, Shivananda left for Dhaka with Abhedananda and some other monks. Although Shivananda was not a public speaker, his inspiring heart-to-heart -heart talks roused spiritual hunger in the devotees' minds. Some wanted initiation from him, but he declined. Shivananda was not interested in becoming a guru. One morning he said to a monk, Last night I saw Holy Mother in a dream. She told me, My son, if you do not give initiation, who else will? You see, I have now received the order from the Mother. 51 However, Shivananda wrote to Brahmananda for advice. Brahmananda joyfully replied, Do initiate people by all means, without any hesitation. 
Whoever will receive initiation from you will certainly be blessed. 50 to 1 day in Dhaka, Shivananda said in the course of conversation, once in Dakshineswar the Master said to Swamiji, Maharaj, and myself, you will have to initiate many people in the future. Can the Master's words be otherwise? He said that so many years ago, and now it has come true, 53 in both Dhaka and my Mensing Shivananda initiated many devotees. One day in Dhaka a devotee approached Shivananda, we are poor, will you be kind enough to visit our home in spite of that? You are right, said the Swami, we don't go to the house of a poor person. The devotee left depressed. The next day Shivananda and his attendant walked to miles to that devotee's home. Overwhelmed with joy, the man exclaimed, What great fortune! Maharaj, welcome to our poor home. Shivananda said with a smile, We do not go to the house of a poor person. We visit the devotee's house that is God's dwelling place, and that is the house of the richest person. 54 Towards the end of March 1922, Brahmananda contracted cholera. Then his diabetes, which had started in 1918, took a serious turn. As soon as Shivananda heard this news, he rushed to Calcutta. Brahmananda was very happy to see him. Shivananda told him, Maharaj, without you how will we live? Please use your willpower so that you can be cured. The best doctors in Calcutta attended him, but Brahmananda's condition steadily deteriorated. Shivananda began to pray to the Master for Brahmananda's recovery. Three days before Brahmananda passed away, Sri Ramakrishna appeared before Shivananda while he was praying. But as soon as Shivananda asked the Master to cure Brahmananda, he turned his face and disappeared. This happened three times that night. At last Shivananda understood that the Master would no longer keep his spiritual son in this world. Brahmananda died on 10th April 1922 as President of the Ramakrishna Order. In 1901 Vivekananda had made Shivananda one of the trustees of Ramakrishna Math and Mission and in 1910 he had become the Vice President. After Brahmananda passed away in 1922, Shivananda was elected President of the Ramakrishna Order. As President he acted as an instrument in the Master's hands. One day he remarked, the Master is an expert player. He can win the game with a valueless kauri, shell coin in ancient India, what do I have? Neither have I learning nor intellect, neither am I a speaker nor am I good looking, still the Master is using me as an instrument for doing his work. 55 Shivananda's humility was phenomenal. Moreover, his allegiance, love for and faith in the Master were exceptional. Most of the time Shivananda lived in Belur Math, but from time to time he visited other centers of the order and inspired the monks and devotees. In January 1923 he went to Varanasi to dedicate a building in the Ramakrishna Advait Ashrama, which was constructed in the memory of Swami Adghutananda, who had died in 1920. Shivananda then visited Allahabad and stayed a few days with Swami Vijnanananda, a brother disciple. The two brother disciples exchanged notes and indulged in reminiscences of their early days with the Master in Dakshineswar. One day both Swamis went by boat to visit the confluence of the Ganges and the Jamuna. Shivananda then went to the Ramakrishna Mission Center at Kankhal at the invitation of Swami Kalyanananda. A couple of days after his arrival it snowed on the peaks of the Himalayan range. Shivananda was very happy to see the panoramic view of the snow-clad mountains. He remarked, For years I haven't seen snow. So Shiva, the lord of the mountains, has been gracious to reveal himself in his white form today. Ah, how magnificent it is! Without snow the Himalayas do not look right. 56. One day he took his bath in the holy water of the Brahmakunda and chanted, Glorifying God. Later he recalled, 
at the time when we were in this region practicing austerity, that was long ago, the whole area was like a forest and very solitary. One could scarcely see a human being anywhere in those days. Now the place has grown into something like a town. It doesn't have the seclusion of the olden times. Shivananda returned to Belur Math on Sri Ramakrishna's birthday. On that auspicious day he initiated some monastics into sannyasa and brahmacharya. The public festival of the Master, which was usually attended by thousands, was held on the following Sunday. The previous night there was torrential rain and water had even entered the kitchen. The senior monks were very apprehensive about the weather and they asked Shivananda's advice. Without saying a word, Shivananda left for the shrine with his rosary. After a while he came out with a radiant face, reciting the following verse from the Bhagavata. Thou hast saved us ever from poisonous water, wild animals and demons, from rain, storm, lightning and fire, from our enemies and fears, O Lord. Then, with great assurance, he said, Go on making preparations for the celebration as usual. Through His grace everything will be all right. Fifty-seven strangely enough, the clouds cleared and the sun shone forth. The festival went off well. During Shivananda's presidency, the activities of the Ramakrishna math and mission expanded considerably. Several new centers were opened in India, Singapore, Europe, North America and South America. He inspired the monks to carry out philanthropic activities and at the same time advised them to harmonize the four yogas in their lives so that they could realize the Atman. One day he said to a monk, Please practice Japam and meditation regularly because that is the source of power. Do not curtail time from meditation. Another day a monk suggested that the monks should place more emphasis on meditation than activity. Shivananda gravely answered, The importance of meditation was in the past, is in the present and will be in the future also. You are talking about work. Without practicing japam and meditation, one cannot work according to the ideal of Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. One should work and worship simultaneously. 58 After dedicating the Vivekananda Temple on 28 January 1924 and the Brahmananda Temple on 7 February 1924 in Belur Math, Shivananda left for South India on 7 April with Swamis Sharvananda and Bodhananda. On their way to Madras, they stopped in Bhuvneshwar and waited. One day, Shivananda and his party were invited for lunch by a devotee. While leaving the Swami noticed some poor people in the alley fighting for the leftover food. Unable to bear it, he asked his host to feed them. Shivananda reminded him of Swamiji's message, Make the poor of humanity your God. The service of these living gods is the religion of this age. In Madras, Shivananda contracted malaria and suffered for more than a week. When his fever subsided, the doctors advised him to go to a cool resort in the hills. Arrangements were made for Shivananda and his attendants to go to Springfield near Kunur in the Nilgiri Hills, 6,000 feet above sea level. Many Maharajas, wealthy people and Europeans had bungalows there. Although he went to Springfield to recover his health, he attracted and initiated many people of Utakamand, Malabar and Madras. He wanted to open a center in the Nilgiri Hills, where the monks could practice sadhana. The scripture says the wishes of the knower of Brahman are always fulfilled. Shivananda wrote in a letter, Mysterious is the power of the Master. A low-caste washerman has donated two acres of land. He had a dream. His chosen deity, Mother Sitla, said to him, Very soon some 160 times God lived with them people will come to you for a piece of land to establish a monastery. Be sure to give them what they want. Having this dream for three consecutive nights, 
he thought, nobody is coming to me for land. One day while searching for the land, the local devotees met the washerman and told him what they were looking for. Immediately he said, for all these days I have been searching for you. Please come along and take two acres of land from my twenty-two acres. Forthwith, he executed a registered deed of transfer for it. Fifty-nine detailed plans were then made so that an ashrama could be established quickly. On 23rd July 1924, Shivananda left Kunur for Bangalore. On the way, he visited the Nattarampalli ashrama for six days. He stayed in Bangalore for four and a half months and initiated many people. On 11th December, he returned to Madras. The next day, he opened Ramakrishna Mission's newly constructed high school building. On 7th January 1925, Shivananda left Madras for Bombay. On the way, he stopped for a few days at Kudda, Pa, a small town where some Hindu and Muslim devotees had established the Ramakrishna Samaj. The devotees gave a reception for Shivananda and afterwards Sharvananda gave a lecture. Shivananda opened the new library hall and the community hall of the Samaj. About this visit Shivananda said later, A Muslim whom I met in Kudapa is so highly esteemed that he received the title of Khan Bahadur from the British government. He belongs to the Sufi sect of Islam but is very devoted to the Master. In Kudapa, there is a little ashrama dedicated to Sri Ramakrishna. The Khan Bahadur, the local collector who is also a Muslim, and several others were responsible for founding the ashrama. We stayed there for a few days. Almost every morning and evening I found the Khan Bahadur seated in a corner of the shrine room in deep humility, intently looking at the portrait of the Master on the altar. He is convinced that the Prophet Muhammad was born as Sri Ramakrishna for the good of the world. 60 on 12th January Shivananda and his party arrived in Bombay. The Ramakrishna Ashrama was then in a rented house at Khair in the western part of Bombay. Inspired by Shivananda, the local devotees purchased two plots of land in Khair and on 6th February the Swami laid the foundation stone of the new Ashrama. He remarked, in times to come, the Lord's work here will have splendid success. He is managing His work, we are simply instruments. While in Bombay, Shivananda met many people every day and also initiated some devotees. After attending the celebration of Vivekananda's birth, the Swami left Bombay for Belur Math. On the way, He stopped at Nagpur and stayed for a week. There was no ashrama at Nagpur, but some devotees who were interested in the teachings of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda had bought a piece of land on which to build a center. Shivananda laid the foundation stone on the newly purchased land and also initiated some devotees. After nearly a year's travel in South India and Bombay, Shivananda returned to Belur Math on 19th February 1925. During this period, he tried to consolidate the activities of the order and establish new centers. His deeply spiritual life and captivating personality created enthusiasm in the minds of the people wherever he went. His visits and talks were also responsible for many new monastic recruits to the order. All four yogas, karma, janana, bhakti and raja are harmoniously practiced in the Ramakrishna order. Shivananda always encouraged the monks to devote more time to meditation, but at the same time to serve suffering humanity. He reminded the monks, it is true that work brings attachment, but this order of the Master, Holy Mother and Swamiji is different. This order does not stand exclusively for spiritual practices, the practice of renunciation and austerity only. This order has a mission that will re-establish the religion of the age. Here one must perform action along with contemplation. Those who will work at are the disciples of the Master, direction will never get attached. 
The master himself will be responsible for them. 61. According to Vedanta philosophy, the real nature of human beings is the Atman, which is actionless, it cannot be attained through action. Some people think that if we do not perform actions, we will be established in the Atman, but this notion is wrong. The Vedantic tradition states that unselfish action purifies the mind, then spiritual practices make the mind one-pointed, which eventually leads to the experience of the Atman. Shivananda wrote to a monk, May the Lord give you indomitable enthusiasm and courage. Know for certain that the ashrama is bound to flourish. Don't worry on that score. Never forget what Swamiji said regarding work. Whatever you do in connection with the monastery or in the way of service to the country is not inferior to spiritual practice. All that you do is His work, even japam and meditation. Never doubt this. Even as repeating His name and thinking about Him is spiritual practice, so is the service of humanity when done selflessly. You are wholly mistaken, in fact, irrational, if you think that you have wasted your life in doing service. Spiritual practice is not of one kind only, it is various. It is renunciation of the ego or the self. 62 In January 1926, Shiv Ananda visited the Ramakrishna Mission Vidyapit at Deoghar, which is in the state of Bihar. Deoghar is a holy place famed for its temple dedicated to Lord Shiva Badyana. On 28 January, Shivananda opened the new school building at Vidyapit and installed the picture of Sri Ramakrishna. He remarked, eventually this school will grow immensely. I see clearly that many wonderful things will happen here. One day he went to visit Lord Shiva in the temple, where he had spiritual experience. During his brief stay in Deoghar, Shivananda caught a chill that developed into a bad cold accompanied by asthmatic spells. One night the Swami could not sleep. The next morning, in spite of his sickness, he cheerfully greeted everyone as usual. He told them his experience. I suffered a great deal last night. I felt almost suffocated. The passages of my nose became stopped up because of my cold and the asthma was very much worse. I did not feel at ease whether sitting, reclining, or lying down. Gradually I felt as if all my senses would stop and life would leave the body. Being at a loss what to do, I started meditating, it being the meditation of an old man, which came from his lifelong practice, my mind soon became absorbed within. I noticed then that there was no pain or suffering and the mind became quiet and placid. The storm and stress of the outer world could not reach there. After remaining in that state a while my mind came down to the external world. 63 Curious, a monk asked, What is that, Maharaj? The Swami replied, That is the Atman. Shivananda's experience substantiates this verse of the Katha Upanishad, the Purusha, not larger than a thumb, the inner self, always dwells in the hearts of men. Let a man separate him from his body with steadiness, as one separates the tender stalk from a blade of grass. Let him know that self as the bright, as the immortal, 2nd March 2017. On his way back to Belur from Deoghar, Shivananda stopped at Jamtara in Bihar, where there is a retreat center of the Ramakrishna order. He installed a picture of the master in a newly built shrine and stayed for a few days. One evening while he was meditating in his room, he suddenly exclaimed three times, Great good has happened in this wilderness. Another day Shivananda arranged a feast for the poor tribal people and was delighted as he saw them enjoying their meal. He remarked, Ah! They are the veritable manifestations of the Lord. In the middle of February 1926, the Swami and his party returned to Belur Math, the first convention of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission, a momentous event for the Ramakrishna Order, 
took place on 1st April 1926 in Belur Math. Monks and devotees arrived from various centers in India as well as abroad. Four direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna attended the convention. Swami Sardananda was the committee chairman and Swami Shivananda was its president. Here are excerpts from Shivananda's speech. Children of Sri Ramakrishna, please allow me to express my sincere felicitations at your congregating together in this convention of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission held for the first time in the annals of the Ramakrishna Order. This convention, I am confident, will afford you a unique opportunity of comparing notes with one another regarding the various works carried on by the different centers that you have met here to represent and also of hearing from the few surviving disciples of Bhagavan Sri Ramakrishna about the ideas and ideals of religion as expressed in and through the life of our Master, which will undoubtedly go a great way towards increasing the necessary solidarity of this organization. From my little experience I tell you, children of Sri Ramakrishna, that our organization lasts as long as the Spirit of God pervades its atmosphere. Love, Catholicity, purity and selflessness are the cornerstones of our organization. No man-made laws can save it from ruin when selfishness eats into its vitals. If you all try to become perfect, Keeping intact your allegiance to this math, which gives you every kind of facility for reaching that perfection, you will add a leaf to the life of the organization. Swamiji shed his blood for the math. His spirit is still hovering over us. This math is the visible body of Sri Ramakrishna. All those that have gone before us are still with us in spirit to help us in all possible ways. We must unfurl all sails so that we may take advantage of the divine wind that is ever blowing to take us to the destined goal. I have fullest confidence in you all who have been earnestly endeavouring to realise this lofty ideal in life. You do not hesitate to brush aside any personal considerations however strong for the realisation of this ideal and I clearly find Sri Ramakrishna, our light and guide, working from behind you and through you. His benign hands are at the back of all of your activities. It is His grace alone that has enabled your works to be crowned with success within such a short period of time. Putting your faith in our Lord every one of you can say, Let me stand where I am and I shall move the world. I exhort you with all the earnestness at my command not to be disturbed or discouraged by momentary failures. Failures are but the stepping stones to success. Viewing success and failure alike, work on with unwavering faith in Him and victory will be yours at the end. I only pray that your surrender may be complete. Be like the arrow that darts from the bow. Be like the hammer that falls on the anvil. Be like the sword that pierces its object. The arrow does not murmur if it misses the target. The hammer does not fret if it falls on a wrong place. And the sword does not lament if it is broken in the hands of its wielder. Yet there is a joy in being made, used, and broken, and an equal joy in being finally set aside. I invoke the blessings of Sri Ramakrishna on you also that he may give you strength and courage to realize truth in this very life. 64 The convention continued for a week and it was a great success. Many papers were read by the monks and by other prominent people. A working committee was formed that consisted of some young swamis who would stay in the headquarters and manage the detailed activities of the order under the supervision of the President, General Secretary and the Trustees, thus lightening the burden of Shivananda and Sardananda. It was also extremely important for the young generation to learn the traditions from the direct disciples and to pass them on to the next generation. The majority of human problems are caused by misunderstandings or lack of communication. 
There is bound to be a certain amount of friction or difference of opinion in any group where many people live and work together. This is true in a family setting as well as in a monastery or convent. Once Shivananda reminded the monks, Look here, the master used to say that one should see the ocean in a drop of water. It was not just a superficial opinion of his, it was a conviction, the outcome of his actual experience. Otherwise, we could not have stayed with him. Instead of seeing our faults, he graciously attracted us to his side and let us live with him as we were. Who is there that is absolutely stainless? All those who have come here have one aim, and that is to be free from imperfection. Nobody came here perfect. These minor weaknesses will eventually disappear through His grace. If one can be resigned at His feet, He will set everything right. 65 On 2nd May 1926, Shivananda again left for South India. On the way, He stopped at Bhuvneshwar, Puri, and Waitair, reaching Madras on 11th May. The monks and devotees were happy to have Shivananda in their midst and he initiated many people and talked to them about the Master, Holy Mother and Swamiji. On 4th June he went to Takumand and stayed in the bungalow of the abbot of the Tirupati temple. He mentioned, the spiritual atmosphere of this place is very elevating, the mind naturally runs after the infinite. Most of the time while he was there, he remained Swami Shivananda times 165 Indron, as if living in a different world. One can guess where his mind was from this conversation. The other day as I sat here silently watching the blue mountain ranges, I experienced something. I saw a luminous figure coming out of this body, meaning his own, and it grew and grew, till at last it enveloped the whole world. Heaving a deep sigh, he then remarked, The Master is my Paramatman, the Supreme Self. It is He who pervades the whole universe. A quarter of His is this whole universe, His other three immortal quarters are in the bright region, Purusha Sukta. Dot 66 One morning Shivananda and his attendant went for a walk. On the way Shivananda saw a western woman, who was a Christian missionary. He cordially said good morning to her. But that woman cast him a scornful look and then turned her face and walked away without returning the greeting. She was angry because the Ramakrishna mission was working among the poor in the Nilgiri hills. The attendant monk was hurt and spoke out, Maharaj, why did you greet her? She left, humiliating you. It does not matter, Shivananda answered. One should respect women of all countries. The Divine Mother manifests in all women of the world. J. Chandi. 67 On 24 September 1926, Shivananda inaugurated the building of the new ashrama in Uttakamand. During his stay there, he came in contact with various sincere devotees. Later, he told this incident. One year I visited the Nigiri Hills. Learning that I was there, a Muslim doctor and his family came all the way from Bombay to see me. After inquiry I found that he was a famous physician in Bombay who had been educated in England and had a very good practice. He was accompanied by his wife and two sons who were very handsome in appearance. In the course of conversation, the doctor said to me, We have come to see you, but my wife is particularly eager to speak to you. Saying this, he moved to the adjoining room. His wife saluted me with great devotion and disclosed many intimate things relating to her spiritual life. Since childhood, she has been a devotee of Krishna. She worships the child Krishna and occasionally has visions of him. After reading the Master's life and teachings, she has become very much devoted to Him. It is her conviction that her chosen deity, Krishna, has been born again as Ramakrishna. I noticed that she has profound love 
and devotion for the Master. She is quite intense in her spiritual practices and the Master has 166 times God lived with them blessed her in many ways. When taking leave of me, she knelt down and bowed to me, saying, Please bless me by touching my head with your hand. You had the blessed privilege of associating with Sri Ramakrishna and you were blessed by him. Please touch my head with the hand that once touched Sri Ramakrishna. And how she wept. I said to myself again and again, Glory be unto the Lord. Blessed is thy power. 68 After staying five months in Uttakamand, Shivananda visited Bangalore, Madras, and Natrampali, at last reaching Bombay on 22nd December. Two years previously he had stayed in a rented place, but now the center had its own building and shrine. Shivananda installed Sri Ramakrishna's picture in the shrine and was happy to see the activities of the ashrama. Then on his way to Belur Math, he stopped at Nagpur again and his holy presence inspired the local devotees to expedite the construction of the new ashrama. He returned to Belur Math on 22nd February 1927. Shivananda's health began to break down. In addition to asthma, he had high blood pressure. But he had no time to rest. He used to initiate devotees regularly, give counsel to the monks and handle the problems of the order that others could not handle. In August 1927, Sardananda, the general secretary of the Ramakrishna order, had a stroke and died. Shivananda was overwhelmed with grief and his health deteriorated even further. The doctors advised him to go to a resort, and a wealthy devotee invited Shivananda to live in his Sait villa at Madhupur in Bihar, which is known for its excellent water and climate. The Swami stayed in that quiet villa for two months, and his health improved considerably. On 27 November 1927, Shivananda went to Varanasi. It was his last visit. He stayed in the Ramakrishna Advait Ashrama for nearly two months and initiated quite a number of people. Shivananda was in an exalted mood in Varanasi. One morning when the monks of both Ashra, Maas came to greet him, the Swami said, Look, I had a very delightful experience last night. In the dead of night I suddenly saw before me a divine figure of white complexion with matted hair and three eyes. His luminous form lighted up the whole place. Ah, what a beautiful, lovely, compassionate face! The vision roused my spiritual energy upward, and my whole being was gradually absorbed in divine bliss. In the meantime I saw that the form gradually vanished, and in its place stood Sri Ramakrishna with a smiling face. Pointing to me, the Master said, You will have to live a little longer, for you still have something more to do. As the Master said this, my mind came down to the normal plane and the body began functioning as usual. It is all His will. I was in a blissful state. The Master is none other than Vishwanath Himself. A curious monk asked, Did you have the vision in a dream? No, no, replied the Swami. I was wide awake. 69 Shivananda managed the Ramakrishna order through his magnanimous personality as well as his spiritual power. One evening in Varanasi, a young Brahmacharin expressed his unwillingness to work according to Shivananda's instructions. The Brahmacharin later became repentant and apologized. Maharaj, you alone know what is best for me. I am ready to do whatever you want me to do. With great tenderness, Shivananda said, That's right. You have rightly understood. It will certainly be good for you if you listen to us and follow our instructions implicitly. Whatever we say comes directly from Sri Ramakrishna. These days I live wholly united with the Master, 70 Shivananda began to initiate people in 1922, but he never claimed that he was a guru. One day in Varanasi he said to a monk, 
the master has effaced from my mind the idea that I am the Guru. Shiva alone is the true Guru, and in this age it is Sri Ramakrishna. It is the master who inspires the devotees to come here, and I tell them as he prompts me from within. He is the soul of my soul, 71. On 15th January 1928, Jawaharlal Nehru came to visit the Ramakrishna Mission Home of Service in Varanasi, and he was delighted to meet Shivananda. A few days later, his wife, Kamala Nehru, came to Shivananda for a blessing and spiritual instruction. She became a devotee and visited the Swami in Belur Math many times. The entire Nehru family maintained a good relationship with the Swamis of the Ramakrishna order. Shivananda left Varanasi on 15th February 1928 and arrived at Patna on the same day. He stayed there for a few days, initiated some people, and then returned to Belur Math on 19th February. This was his last outing as president of the order. Once a senior monk asked Shivananda to take disciplinary action against a monk and expel him from the order. Shivananda listened to the accusations attentively and then asked the senior monk, does he not have one or two good qualities? When the senior monk mentioned a couple of the monk's good qualities, Shivananda's face radiated with joy and he exclaimed, that is enough. That monk stayed in the order.72 Another time Shivananda told the monks, you cannot reform people by simply talking and reprimanding. If you have the spiritual power, redirect and change the inner tendencies of people. Talk to the Lord and pray to Him so that He may do the work of reforming. If He is gracious, then in a trice bad tendencies, will undergo wholesale transformation. 73 168 times God lived with them in March 1928. Swami Parmananda, head of the Vedanta Center in Cohasset, Massachusetts, visited Belur Math. On 3rd March, he requested Shivananda, Maharaj, I am making a movie of Belur Math and our dot American devotees want to see the Swamis also. If it is not inconvenient for you, Please come downstairs. 74 Shortly Shivananda came down and walked in the monastery compound with Subodhananda and some monks and devotees. This film taken by Parmananda is the only motion picture we have of any direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. The original film is in the archives of Ananda Ashrama, Cohasset. However, it was included in the video Ramakrishna, a documentary, produced by the Vedanta Society of St. Louis. In the late 1920s, the renowned French writer Romain Roland began to write the biographies of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. Shivananda assigned Swami Ashokananda to help provide Romain Roland with all the available information and Shivananda himself answered many of the writer's questions. Roland acknowledged in the preface of the life of Ramakrishna, I owe a great deal to the present venerable head of the Belur Math and superior of the order, Swami Shivananda, who has been good enough to give me his precious personal memories of the Master. After returning from the West, Vivekananda had the idea to build a temple for Sri Ramakrishna in Belur Math. At that time he directed Vijnana, Nanda in designing the temple. When he saw the plans, Swamiji said, the temple will be constructed later and I shall see it from above. In the beginning of 1929, the trustees of the order finally decided to have the foundation stone laid by Shivananda. Arrangements were made and Shivananda laid the stone on Sri Ramakrishna's birthday, 13th March 1929, in the presence of Abhedananda, Vijnanananda, M. and many monks and devotees. On 14th January 1938, the Ramakrishna Temple of Belur Math was at last dedicated by Vijnanananda, a direct disciple of the Master. Some glimpses of Swami Shivananda Swami Shivananda was an extraordinary teacher and a guru by divine right. His own life was a commentary on what he preached. 
He never stood upon a public platform or addressed large audiences. But he kept his spiritual treasures open for seekers of God. He solved their spiritual problems and answered their questions on religion and philosophy from his own personal experience. As to his own realization, Shivananda once exclaimed, I am happy. I have realized the Purnam, the infinite, by the grace of the Master. He then joyously chanted the peace mantram of the Bhradaranyaka Upanishad, All that is invisible is verily the infinite. All that is visible is also the infinite. The whole universe has come out of the infinite, which is still the infinite. 75 One day Swami Kamleshwarnanda told Shivananda, I want to study the Upanishads with you. Shivananda replied, Can you study our lives? Our lives are verily Upanishads. Here you will find the quintessence of the scriptures. The light that I received from the Master I am sharing with you. The flame of one lamp lights another, thus we are all connected. 76. Swami Satprakashananda recalled, Once during a walk at Belur Math I asked Mahapurushji, Maharaj, some take initiation from the Holy Mother and others from Swami Brahmananda. Is there any difference between the two? He said in reply, No, I do not see any difference whatsoever. The same Ganges water is coming out of two taps. The same grace of the Master is flowing out through the Holy Mother and Maharaj, the one substance is in two receptacles. But look here, what do you mean by taking initiation? They receive it, they receive it. It is given, it is given. No sooner did I hear this than my inner eyes were opened with regard to initiation and a great problem was solved for me. Dependence on the divine coupled with self-reliance ruled my heart. 77. It is amazing how Shivananda, through his realization, solved both scriptural questions and the monk's spiritual problems. Swami Nikhilananda wrote, I do not remember having asked him any spiritual or philosophical question. I do not believe he ever claimed to be a scholar or philosopher. Whatever instructions he gave to the devotees came from his direct experience, couched in simple language, and his profound faith that he acted as an instrument of Sri Ramakrishna, who guided him in his words, thoughts, and action. The ego was completely absent in him. Once I asked him a much debated question about the present birth being the last one in the case of those who have taken shelter at Sri Ramakrishna's feet. In reply he said that it was his belief also. I argued that according to the scriptures, only those who are completely free from desires are not reincarnated and such desirelessness is not possible unless one directly experiences Brahman in the Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Mahapurush Maharaj said, I am not a scholar. I do not know the scriptures. Can you tell me what is the cause of rebirth? Is it not unfulfilled desires? I agreed. Tell me, he said, Suppose you are at the point of death and Sri Ramakrishna appears before you. Suppose he asks you if you have any unfulfilled desire for which you want to assume another human body. What will you say? I said, I do not believe I have any desire to fulfill for which I would like to come back to this world again. Then this is your last birth. This desirelessness one feels through the Master's grace, said Mahapurush Maharaj. On another occasion, when I had just returned from Kamila in Bangladesh, after a long absence, I saluted Mahapurush Maharaj and told him in the course of conversation that I was not making any spiritual progress. None whatsoever, he asked. I said that I did not feel any. Listen, my child, Perhaps you mean to say that you have not made as much spiritual progress as you would desire. Let me tell you something. You must be happy to see me after a long time. Are you not? Certainly, Maharaj, I replied. He said, I am also very happy to see you. 
What is the cause of this mutual attraction? Neither you nor I have any blood relationship. You are happy to see me because you love God. I too am happy because I love God. This love of God binds us both together. On account of this love of God we feel happy when we see each other. When you were away I missed you. You too must have missed me. This love of God is the sure sign of spiritual progress. 78. There is a saying, every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. If a child's body is filthy, does the mother throw it away? She washes the child and takes it on her lap again. Similarly, an illumined Guru purifies the minds of impure souls. Swami Apurvananda recorded. One morning Swami Shivananda, after lying down for a while, was seated on his cot. He seemed solemn and indrawn, but suddenly said to the attendant standing near, Will you go and see if there is someone who wants initiation? The attendant looked here and there and then went downstairs, where he found a woman who wanted initiation. After inquiry, he was startled by the information she gave about herself. She was young and had come from a village. She told the story of her sinful life and said that, although born in a Brahman family, she had kept bad company and gone astray. In a remorseful tone she said, May I not see him, Mahapurushji, once? When the attendant, looking disturbed, returned to the Swami, the latter inquired very earnestly, Tell me, is someone there? The attendant reluctantly replied, Maharaj, it is a lady who wants initiation, but... Before the attendant could finish what he felt he must say, Mahapurush remarked, What of that? Ask her to bathe in the Ganges, and come to me after visiting the shrine. Sri Ramakrishna is the Redeemer of the Fallen. He came especially to uplift them. What will happen to them if He does not come to their rescue? One could not then call Him the Saviour of the Fallen. The Swami was ready to shower His blessings upon her. Later, when after her bath, she came for initiation, He said, as if He knew everything about her, what is there to fear, my daughter? You will certainly be blessed, since you have taken refuge in Sri Ramakrishna, our Master and Saviour. Say this, whatever sins I have committed in this life and in lives past, I offer them here, i.e., to the Master, and I will sin no more. After initiation the woman appeared to be an altogether new person. Later that day the Swami remarked, do you know why there is so much sickness in this body, so much suffering? The SMS of others are being worked out in this body, if not, why should it suffer so much? 79 In the last part of his life, Shivananda could not travel because of his illness and old age. However, people came from all over the country to receive his blessings. It was not possible for him to remember the names of all his disciples. Once, seeing his prolonged meditation, an attendant asked, Why do you need to meditate so much? The Swami answered, Not for myself, my child. I initiate many people into spiritual life, but not all can keep up the necessary practices. Others find it possible to do so, yet make little headway. When I concentrate, their faces flash before me and I pray for them, removing the obstructions to their progress. 81 night he told his attendant, Today the Queen of Balnagir came. She made a great statement. While leaving she bowed down and told me in tears, Maharaj, you have many devotees like me, but I have none like you. This great statement was made by Radha to Krishna. The attitude of the gopis was to surrender completely to Krishna. 81 Puma Haider, an old fisherman from Bali, would catch fish in the Ganges, not far from the monastery. As he was feeble and bent with age, most of the time his catch was poor and not sufficient to provide a meager living. 
Shivananda used to watch this old man from the upper veranda, and his heart would go out to him. In order to help him, Shivananda instructed the monk in charge of the kitchen to buy whatever he caught and to pay him handsomely. In addition, the Swami now and then would give him cloth and other things. For a few days the Swami did not see Puma, and then after inquiring learned that he had died. Immediately he sent a monk with sufficient money and clothes to his widow, so that she could perform rites for her departed husband. Afterwards, he sent money to Puma's widow regularly. Eighty to one noon after dinner, Shivananda saw a cobbler mending shoes while seated under the mango tree in the monastery courtyard. He told his attendant, Ah, we all have had our meals, whereas this man is drudging there with an empty stomach. Go and give him a good quantity of offered fruits and sweets. The attendant obeyed and on his return found Shivananda standing by the window of his room with a half rupee in his hand, looking intently at the cobbler. Seeing the man eating, Shivananda remarked, Ah, did you notice this? The man must have been awfully hungry. That is why he began to eat right away. Stand here and watch. I am having a little fun. Saying this, he dropped the coin in front of the man, who looked up and understood the situation. Overwhelmed with gratitude and joy, the man saluted him with folded hands and put the coin in his pocket. Later, finding a monk bargaining with the cobbler regarding the price for the work done, Shivananda reproached him, Ah! The man is poor. Why bargain with him? 83. One night a thief entered the room of Josephine MacLeod, Joe, an American devotee of Swamiji, who was staying in the guest house of Belur Math. When the thief grabbed her locket reliquary, which contained Vivekananda's hair, Joe woke up and shouted. Swami Punyananda and some others were staying downstairs. They hurriedly ran and caught the thief at the head of the stairs. Punyananda gave him a good beating, tied him with a rope, and took him to the veranda of the math building. In those days, every morning Shivananda would walk through the math compound inspecting everything, especially the dairy. On his way that morning, Shivananda saw the thief and said to him jokingly, Look, is this a place where one should come to steal? If these boys take turns beating you, you will die. The Swami left after saying this. After a while Shivananda returned from his rounds and began eating his breakfast. Then Joe entered his room and informed the Swami, Mahapurush Maharaj, you have heard that a thief entered my room, I think he is a devotee. Otherwise why would he take my locket leaving so many things in the room? You know, that locket is a reliquary seven containing Swamiji's hair. I believe his devotion for Swamiji was the motive for stealing it. Childlike, Shivananda at once believed the words of Joe. He asked Punyananda to release the thief, take him to the Ganges, and make sure that he had a bath and changed into the new cloth that he had sent for him. When Shivananda's orders were carried out, the thief went to bow down before Shivananda. The Swami affectionately asked him, Hello, would you like to become a monk? 84. Although the thief's answer was unrecorded, his mind undoubtedly carried this memory throughout his life. The scriptures say that a knower of Brahman wanders in this world sometimes like a child, sometimes like a madman, sometimes like a wise man and sometimes like a fool. He is ever happy with supreme bliss. One day Shivananda wished to eat from a gold plate. His attendants were in a dilemma, as it was not possible for the poor monastery to buy a gold plate. A monk with presence of mind remarked, the tender banana leaf is also called gold leaf. The inner stalk of the tender banana leaf is golden in color and it can remind one of a gold plate. Immediately Shivananda said, you are right. Henceforth I shall eat on a banana leaf. 
His attendants were relieved. They spread the banana leaf on his regular plate and then served food to the Swami. 85 One night Shivananda asked his attendant, Could you buy a big catfish tomorrow? Yes, Maharaj, answered the monk. The next day he went to the market and bought a big live catfish for the Swami, who was pleased to see it. First he said, Make a nice fish curry out of it. The next moment he said, Well, this fish was in a small tank. How nice it would be if we let it go in the Ganges. This fish will be happy. Now please release it into the Ganges. Immediately the Swami's order was carried out. The fish disappeared, wiggling its tail. Shivananda's face reflected the fish's joy of freedom and he exclaimed, How wonderful! What joy! 86 Shivananda had tremendous love and respect for Swamiji and Brahmananda. Sometimes he would enter Swamiji's room and carefully check every little article in it. Once while looking at a group picture his eyes fell on his own figure and he began to laugh. A. Hey, who is this rogue? Here he said. This one became a saint having been with saints. Referring to six disciples of the Master who were earmarked as Ishwarkotis, godlike souls, Shivananda remarked, Swamiji, Maharaj, and a few others belonged to that category. I was not so high, but now I also have become an Ishwarkoti through His grace. 87 Swami Apurvananda recorded, One afternoon after His rest the Swami was seated on His bed facing the west. Sometimes he meditated closing the eyes and sometimes looking at a picture of the master on the wall. The door and the window of the western veranda were open. Suddenly Mahapurushji raised his head upright and pointing to the mango tree in the courtyard said, Look, such a great amount of power has accumulated within me that if I tell that tree, be liberated, it will be liberated. I can make people free just by looking in a particular direction. Saying so, he again bent his head and became absorbed in meditation. 88. In spite of his old age and illness, he kept track of the monastery activities, especially the master's service. He reminded the monks and the devotees, the master himself is present in Belur Math, for Swamiji installed him here. Know this as the truth, 89 He guided the worshipper in serving Sri Ramakrishna, after daily worship recite some hymns to the Master. In the afternoon, instead of making several garlands, make one jasmine garland for the Master and spend the remaining time in Japam, meditation, and studying the scriptures. In the summer after putting the Master to bed, you must fan him for some time. The Swami Himself demonstrated how to prepare a betel roll and tobacco for the Master. 90 Swami Gyandananda recalled, One day I was sweeping the courtyard of the mat near the mango tree. After I finished sweeping, Mahapurush Maharaj said, Looking at the courtyard, Hello, what are you doing? The Master walks here. I still see dust and used match sticks on the courtyard. Clean this place with special care so that the master can walk with joy and his feet won't get dirty. After this I realized that the master dwells everywhere in the monastery. Although we do not see him, the Swami does. 91 Swami Nikilak Mananda reminisced, I used to mop the floor of the shrine every day. Sometimes the rainwater would flood the southern veranda of the shrine. One day after it rained, I did not mop the veranda. Mahapurush Maharaj observed it from his room. Calling me to his room, he said, Look, is it the way to serve the master? The master can't walk on the veranda because of the rainwater. His feet will get wet. What are you doing here? I see the master walking on that veranda every afternoon. My clerk, Always be careful so that the Master may not feel discomfort. He is the soul of our souls, the Lord of the universe. If He is pleased, 
The whole world will be pleased, 90 to seeing God in everything and everywhere is the culmination of the Vedantic experience. Shivananda's mind was full of Ramakrishna. He once told Brahmananda in Belur Math, Raja, I see the Master even these days. Were it not so, it would be unbearable for me to live. 93 Pointing to the picture of Sri Ramakrishna, Shivananda said to the devotees, Don't think of this picture of the Master as an ordinary picture. He himself dwells in it and listens to the prayers of the devotees. 94. In another occasion Shivananda said, In this age the name of Sri Ramakrishna is the mantram for liberation. Rama and Krishna, the combination of these two incarnations, is simultaneously manifested in Ramakrishna. If you chant the name of Ramakrishna, you will get the result of Japam of the Rama Mantram as well as the Krishna Mantram. He was born to liberate sinners and sufferers, and showed a simple and bow a full patfi for God realization. 95 Swami Shivananda times 175 towards the end Swami Shivananda began to complete his role in Ramakrishna's drama. He carried the Master's message wholeheartedly and distributed it among the masses. Pointing to his own body he told a monk, This is not just an ordinary body, it has its own distinction. God realization has been attained in and through this body. This body has touched Bhagavan Sri Ramakrishna, lived with him, served him. The Master has made this body a vehicle for the propagation of his message for this age. Otherwise this body is nothing but a cage of flesh and blood. Should he feel it necessary to maintain this body longer, he will do so. Else, I am ready to depart at his first call. I am waiting for His call, 96 After illumination, only compassion motivates the mind of a Jivan Mukta, one who is free while living. Shivananda struggled to keep his mind on the relative plane so that he could help others. Swami Ashokananda wrote, During the day he would have many things scattered over his bed. Though his assortment varied, it would contain something like the following, a stick, a musical instrument, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the Gita, the Chandi, Sanskrit texts and Bengali folk tales, as well as books that were plentifully illustrated. At times he might playfully shake the stick at the attendants, or finger the musical instrument, and very often he read. The monks did not at first understand why he wanted his bed cluttered with so many things, but one day he said, my mind wants to rush towards the Absolute all the time. That is why I am trying with all these trifling diversions to hold my mind down. Just as a mother gives her child toys to keep it engaged, so I am also trying by various means to make my mind forget the Absolute. 97 As a Vedanta monk Shivananda was strong and uncompromising, he always reminded the monks of the ideal, renunciation of lust and gold. If you can renounce lust of the flesh and the greed for wealth, everything will be all right. Above everything, a monk should observe the vow of chastity and poverty. Purity and guilelessness should be your watchwords. The Master forgives all failings except hypocrisy and self-deception. Those who play false and take to hypocritical ways do not belong here. The Master does not allow them to remain in the order, He removes them. Only those who are genuine can stay. 98 However, Shivananda was soft and tender-hearted, and he acted like a loving mother in the monastery. During the malaria season, he would go to the kitchen and guide the cook in preparing a special diet for the sick monks. A monk recalled, a western woman was staying in the Belur guest house and she was sick. I was seated in the mother's temple. I saw Mahapurushji walking from the math building to the guest house carrying an orange in his hand for that woman. His face was serene and he was absorbed within himself. It was an unforgettable scene, zero zero his love seemed perennial and inexhaustible.
Even animals and birds shared in his affection and care. He would regularly go to the dairy and feed the cows bananas, molasses and barley powder. Quite often people would see the old Swami stroking the cows in the monastery compound. He would ask his attendant to spread grain on the roof adjacent to his room so he could watch the birds enjoying their food. His pet dog, Kelo, would get baths and special dinners. Pointing to Kelo, Shivananda would say, Kelo is my dog and I am the dog of the Master. 101 night the Swami was meditating in his room when a cat entered, crying Mew Mew. Shivananda bowed to the cat with folded hands and then said to his attendant, The Master has kept me in such a state that I see everything as conscious. I see the play of consciousness in the wall, door, bed, and even in this cat, 101 Swami Shivananda was keen to spread the message of the Master throughout the world. During his presidency, the following Swamis of the Ramakrishna order were sent to North America, South America, and Europe. Swami Prabhvananda in 1923, Swamis Dayananda and Khilananda in 1926, Swamis Madhvananda and Jnaneswarnanda in 1927, Swami Vividishnanda in 1928, Swami Devatmananda in 1930, Swamis Ashokananda and Nikhilananda in 1931, Swami Vijananda in 1932, Swami Yatiswarananda in 1933. These Swamis and others worked hard to carry out the mission of Vedanta inaugurated by Vivekananda. It was a golden era for the order. The disciples of the Master departed one after another, M. the recorder of the Gospel, and Swami Subodhananda died in 1932. The death of these dear ones caused grief to Shivananda's heart. Sometimes he would say, Almost all are now gone. With whom shall I talk? There is no longer any joy in conversation. Dhan Gopal Mukherjee, one of Shivananda's disciples, who had been abroad for many years, came to Belur to see him, but seeing the Swami's fragile health, he burst into tears. Shivananda consoled him, when Buddha was about to attain Parinirvana, final release from the body, Ananda was overwhelmed with grief. At this Buddha said, Why are you weeping, Ananda? This life lasts for fifty, sixty, or at the most a hundred years. But I am about to attain eternal life. 102 As the days passed, Shivananda's health failed rapidly because of high blood pressure and asthma, and finally he became bedridden. Sometimes Swami Shivananda times 177, he would apologize to his attendants, I am putting all of you to so much trouble in spite of his ill health. He continued to have various visions and spiritual experiences. One evening he said to an attendant, Put the holy ashes of the Lord Shiva on my forehead and spread a silk chadar on the bed. Look, the Master has come. Another afternoon he said to his attendants, Just now Swamiji and Maharaj came and said to me, Tarakda, let us go. Did you not see them? 103 On 24th April 1933 Shivananda expressed a desire to see the monastery. His monastic disciples carried him in a chair. He bowed down to all the temples, visited the dairy, the flower and vegetable gardens, the stores and offices. At last he bowed down to the mother Ganges. His face was beaming with joy. This was his final tour around the monastery, and his last words were, Whatever is true will happen. Truth alone triumphs in the end. Truth alone persists. That which is false does not last. Therefore one should not regret it. 104 Although Shivananda did not write any books, his inspired conversations were recorded and published in For Seekers of God. Many monks and devotees also left their valuable reminiscences of the Swami, which were printed in Bengali in three volumes as Shivananda Smriti Sangraha. On 25th April, Shivananda initiated three devotees. 
compared to other days, he was feeling better. At 11 a.m. he had his lunch. While drinking a little buttermilk after his meal, his right hand suddenly began to tremble and he put his cup down. A stroke of apoplexy paralyzed his right side and his speech became impaired. He tried to say something to his attendant but failed. Immediately the attendant called other swamis and helped Shivananda lie down on the bed. At once word was sent to Calcutta for expert medical help and several doctors hurried to the monastery. All effort was made to provide the best medical care and several doctors attended Shivananda daily. The news of Shivananda's critical condition spread rapidly and for months monks and devotees came from far and near just to see his face. Akhandananda came from Sargachi and Vijnanananda came from Allahabad to see their beloved brother disciple. Abhedananda, another disciple of the Master, also came to visit Shivananda. Although Shivananda could not talk, he could understand and express his feelings. He would receive his visitors with a smile and sometimes greet them by lifting his left hand. Seeing him one knew that the Swami was in bliss and had no body consciousness. Looking at Shivananda's serene and joyful face, Pandit Pramthanath Tarkabhushan, an authority on the Hindu scriptures, remarked, I have twelve read in books about Jivan Muktas or illumined souls. Today I have seen one face to face in the flesh. The Swami seemed to be in deep samadhi all the time, once in a while coming down to the normal plane. I am indeed very much blessed in meeting this Supreme Yogi. I have studied about Samadhi in the scriptures, thought about it and discussed it a great deal. But never before have I had the good fortune to see a man established in Samadhi, 105 on 3rd February 1934, nine months after the stroke, Shivananda developed pneumonia. His condition slowly deteriorated. Several eminent doctors struggled to keep this great soul alive. Swami Shivananda lived to see Sri Ramakrishna's birth anniversary on 15th February and the public festival on Sunday, 18th February. He passed away at 5.36 p.m. on Tuesday, 20th February 1934. At the final moment Shivananda's face beamed with joy and the hair of his head stood on end, both considered to be auspicious signs. The monks chanted Shankara's six stanzas on Nirvana, Pushpadanta's Shiva Mahina Stotram, the Upanishads, and the Gita. Abhedananda came and offered flowers at the feet of Shivananda and recited a line from the Bhagavata, O Great Soul, my salutations at your lotus feet. According to the traditional custom, Shivananda's body was bathed with Ganges water, decorated with flowers and sandalpaste and then consigned to the flames of the funeral pyre on the bank of the Ganges. Hundreds of monks and devotees solemnly repeated, Glory be unto Sri Ramakrishna. If anyone ever asked where he would go after leaving the body, Swami Shivananda replied that his rightful place would be in Ramakrishna Loka, abode of Ramakrishna, with the Master. His life is a glowing example of a person who continuously lived in God consciousness. One day he humbly said to a monk, Look, I am my master's dog. As a dog protects the precious wealth of its master from robbers, so I am protecting the valuable spiritual treasures, discrimination, renunciation, knowledge, devotion of the master in this monastery. He who stays here like a faithful dog will attain the greatest good. 106.